Hello, everyone, and welcome to Office Hours. As always, thanks for programming our show with your questions. You know, if you use the QR code that you'll see pop up during the show, you can get your questions into the queue. But if you want to get even more involved, use Mukana. Not only will that add your questions, but you'll be able to vote on those questions because the questions with the most votes is how we prioritize our topics and our discussion every day. Today in our second hour, Alex is going to be taking us through auto clipping with AI. So it should be a fascinating second hour. But right now, let's get started with our first questions. Alex? Alex, what do we got? Uh, we have a bunch of questions all about the same thing. So we're going to kind of group these together. We had a question from Andy Kokendorfer, Adrian Watkins from all over the world. Andy Kokendorfer from, from uh, Vieira, Florida. Uh, Adrian Watkins uh, from Wellington, New Zealand. And Felix Rob Robillard from uh, Quebec, uh, Canada, Montreal, Quebec. And uh, they all uh, asked the same question or, or a similar question to Mike Gaines in Los Angeles. And Mike asks... Nikon announces the acquisition of RED. Once the forefront of cinema technology have the battle lines been drawn, or are they playing into a long game of catch-up with the likes of Airy, Sony, Blackmagic, etc.? Big news roiling through the industry. I think I saw that first about 4 o'clock this morning, and it popped right up and went, oh, I wasn't expecting that. Alex, what do you think? It's going to be interesting. It's a good move by, I think Nikon needed to do something. You know, I think that they, you know, they were really, they didn't have a real video solution. So Canon has a video uh, solution and Sony has a video solution. And um, and then there's a lot of video video solutions from Blackmagic and Aerie and, and so on and so forth. So there's, they really are, were kind of um, in a, in a bind, so to speak, um, you know, where they didn't really have a good solution there. So buying red, I think made a lot of sense. I think that red, of course, broke new ground. When Red came out, it may seem like a lot of money, but forty thousand dollars or whatever that they were selling, twenty, you know, these these were a fraction of what they were before, and they changed the whole the the whole market. I think that the the hard part is is just the mass, and I think that really one of the things that put a lot of pressure on Red was that Airy pivoted very well from film. You know, so Airy did a really good job of pivoting out of film and into um, a, uh, a digital format. And they really figured out how to cater to um, filmmakers. And so they made, a film, they made a camera that was relatively easy to use as a filmmaker that was going to get you good footage, that was going to have a film-like look. And so they, and they just took that market over time um, because of that. And when they first came out, we were like, really, Ari, maybe you should just give up. <laughs> you know, like, like their very first version that came out, you were like, that's cute. I mean, but you're a film company, but they they really did a great job at making that pivot. Sony also did a great job at making that pivot. So they they have, you know, a lot of their everything from the Venice at the top all the way down to their, you know, to their lines that are below a thousand dollars. They built this gradient um, that really serves a lot of different markets and are very competitive with what Red's trying to do. Not as good as Red in many places. But very good. And then Black Magic came up and uh, put a lot of pressure on Red in that sub $10,000 range, as did Canon. So there was a lot of pivoting and a lot of adjustment that was done that was better than most of us thought would happen, to be honest. You know, I think that um, those, you know, that, that the bigger companies um, did a pretty good job. They got caught off guard for quite some time. There was a solid five or six years where there were just lots of independent filmmakers and everything else using Reds. But as these other cameras came into it, we have to remember that when you look at the overall cost of a film, the rental on a on a camera is just not a big part of that that number, and so so it didn't matter whether the the camera on a at a film level whether the camera was you know an eighty thousand dollar camera or a ten thousand dollar camera. The di difference is a couple hundred dollars a day, you know, when it when you rent it, and so so that was that was something that was hard to calculate, but it also you know, this whole market of the sub $10,000 camera changed the way we, we make corporate films, changed the way we make educational films, changed, you know, like suddenly we have full frame sensors and, and super 35s. The new pressure that is being applied to red is that the cameras in the phones are getting great, you know, and so now there's a pressure at that, you know, in the phone market of kind of pressing up against all of those things. And so I think that it made sense for red to sell while the selling was as good as it was going to be. And I think it was a great choice by Nikon to, um, to acquire red and, and add to something that they were sorely missing. Nigel, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I agree. I think that I don't know as much about uh, the the cinema lens and camera side of it. I know more about the, the photography, and I think Nikon, Nikon was in a difficult situation long term with declining markets. And I think Sony had really stolen a lot of their 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 food, stolen their cheese. Canon had managed to keep a, a place for itself in the market with a very loyal 
provider, but but Sony really has taken that away. What I was interested, I don't know if anybody knows, uh, I was reading the press release. Was Red a private company? Was it fully owned? That's a very interesting sentence I, in the in it saying that it was a partnership. And I couldn't quite work out what yeah, the structure was. Uh, so Red was started by the founder of Oakley, um, and uh, and it was, and I believe that it was largely owned still by him. So I think so, uh, Jim Gennard and yeah. and um, um, oh, why am I forgetting the original uh, Jim Gennard and the president. Um, I can't remember the president yeah. of the company, Jared Land, and the two of them. I think were held the company. I'm not. Yeah, I don't think that they. It was always their little project. So, so I think that they. Um, it was nev- never, never went public. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Interesting. You know, for me, the fascinating thing is that Canon made the pivot when they started doing their cinema cameras, the C300, C500, and the rest of that, actually opened a shop in Hollywood directly to take care of the cinematographers who were using those Canon cameras to try to, you know, push up their quality into movies. I'm wondering if Nikon, Nikon from some of my friends on the other side of the world, um, are going to do something similar, try well, Red, to establish more one. bases. Yeah. Yeah, so but, Red has a studio in now. I think it's near Gower Studios. In, oh, that's uh, right. Yeah, yeah. So Red has its own its own space. I think it actually has a couple of them, and they were even. I think uh, um, they were looking at the the place that I used to be in. There was some there was some scuttlebutt that they were going to take over thirty two ten, but they never never quite made the turn. Um, but the uh, but that was um, uh, you know I think that they were trying to figure that out. But I do think. Providing those resources to filmmakers does make a big difference as far as being able to test things, being able to even shoot small things, I think is, is, is really a lot of interesting opportunities. So I think with more uh, money, which Nikon's definitely going to bring, because we have to remember that Nikon is a big company and film cameras and still cameras are just a very small part <laughs> of what, what Nikon does, uh, you know, overall from an imaging perspective. And so, um, but I do think this shores up the air, the film area where they just didn't have any, they had very little. I believe that they, if I am correct, correct me if I'm wrong, if I get, if I mixed up these brands, but I believe Nikon also bought Mark Roberts. Um, so I think that Mark, I think they own Mark Roberts as well. And Jeff can tell me. In the, in the and that's kind of the telemetry, really that, sophisticated. That does motion control arms. And motion so, control arms, um, yeah. so combining all these things together is pretty exciting. Yeah. Well, the industry continues to evolve and move along, if nothing else. So interesting day today. Let's go on to our next question. Uh, Next question is from David Brady in New New York, New York. And David asks, are the Zoom clients advanced video settings undermining all the hardware effort? And when should they be used or not? Denoise, super resolution, etc. Zoom settings scroll down to advanced. Actually, this was interesting because one of our friends here on the panel today it kind of explored those in the pre-show. Alex, what do you think is going to be the result here? I think it's. I think that these are a lot of tools that will make things better for the people who need it. <laughs> so if you have a if you have a not a great uh, webcam, if you have lower resolution, if you have uh, you know things are a little bit noisier, I think those things are are good for people there. I don't think it undermines what we do. I think the level of work that a lot of us put into our systems and, and how we look still looks dramatically different than what it's going to look like on a on a webcam. Um, but but I do think that it can improve that visual quality, and I think that they should keep on doing that. And I think that you know I think also you're seeing Apple do a lot of that, where now if you use your iPhone, it's able to use the shorter depth of field, you know, the shorter depth of field that it can create, which is actually much more natural. You know, the, the, what I'd love to see if as we're going down this path with Zoom, if anyone at Zoom is watching. Um, the 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 thing that's problematic with the Zoom blur, and, and I haven't used Zoom blur for a long time, so maybe it changed and I'm wrong. <laughs> but um, the last time I looked at Zoom blur, it really looked like the, the design of Zoom blur was to obscure what was behind you. Like that's the goal. We're going to blur it out so that it's not there to look nice. It's there to keep you from seeing what's back there. It would be great to have another button that, that was called, you know, uh, uh, photographic zoom or or you know or art zoom zoom art zoom or something like that that is that looks like the what apple's doing which so what apple is doing is what looks like short depth of field not i'm trying to obscure everything behind me and i think that it, and, and i think that if zoom put that effort into it there is a point somewhere in the future where a lot of us might not might lean into webcams a little bit more because a lot of us don't want to make it look dorky and weird, we just want it to be a little out of focus behind us. And you, right now, unless you're using an Apple phone as a camera, you don't get that, or, or an Apple device as a camera, because the Apple, I think all the new Apple devices will do it. 
um, that that kind of softer depth of field, like what Nigel has, who's about to answer the <laughs> answer the question. But that's that's what that's the kind of look that we're that I think a lot of us would like to have that can't we can't get that right now. Boca blur for want of a better term, Nigel. Yeah, I mean, I don't know whether David is asking something a bit more specific, which is if you go into advanced settings on video, there are four questions. Should we have those ticked, checked, or as you say in America, ticked or not ticked? They're optimized quality for video to denoise, super resolution, hard rate acceleration for sending and receiving. Are, in the office hours world, should... I, I would uh, I would turn the hardware acceleration on. I If you have a good system, I'd probably leave the other ones off. You know, the other ones are there to help you when you have a... Um, when you, but I wouldn't have the computer ever do more than it has to um, on on my image. If you know, I'd rather tune it in hardware. You know, again, if you're playing a big game <laughs> with cameras and mics and stuff like that, you don't need the computer to do that. But I think that there's plenty of people I could see bringing someone in over a webcam. And that's what they have, and maybe I was lucky enough to get them a good mic. But I'm stuck with their webcam. Turning some of that stuff on may make sense. Um, so, so I think that those are the things that, you know, I think it, it make it's kind of, it depends. There's sometimes where we tell people on a live show, Hey, why don't you turn the original audio back off? <laughs> you know, like, you know, just, you know, if I'm recording it, <laughs> I want to do it. But there's times when we tell people to just turn the original audio when for a live show, we'll tell them to turn it on because there's no way for us to fix what's coming out of their mic. And we know that it won't sound as good as if they had had a great mic, but it'll sound better than what they're delivering to us right now. So I think it's, it's making that decision. Chris Fenwick. Oops, I'm getting a finger pause no, no, for no, those of you listening I'm sorry, only. I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. No, hardware, was hardware say, mutes are great. Just, you know what, Alex? You're so right. Thanks for shaming me. I feel better now. <laughs> I've gotten all the attention I need today. <laughs> what I was going to say, and my hardware mute works fine, but I was in a different mode over here, was um, regarding the Apple and the depth of field. And I think you're right. I think it... it it, it might be good if it was like blur obscure and blur cinematic. But in if you take us, uh, what does the iPhone call it? Uh, cinematic mode photos. If people don't know this, you should. When you go into edit mode, after you've taken a photo on your camera, there's an f-stop control. And you can ad adjust the fake f-stop, which is a varying the amount of blur. If we can do that. And maybe it's a matter of doing it live with video versus uh, 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 post-processing on a still. It would be great to just have a, a, a slider. Like just get, zoom, click the blur thing, and just give me a slider. How much do I want to blur it? Do I want to make it more cinematic or do I want to hide the fact that I haven't made the bed behind me, you know? <laughs> I think we'll eventually I think, get I think a Zeiss blur and... I think a missing opportunity blur. here is is uh, is um, LUTs and, and and looks that are designed. So in Zoom, it should drop down and have the Quentin Tarantino look or the or the Matrix look or the you know like like you know. I, I think there's an opportunity there there's for Orange and Stu Mashwoods if you're watching. <laughs> like let's let's get you together with Zoom and have you build a bunch of looks so that they come in and, and you can say I want to look like the Matrix or I want to look like uh, you know I want to look like Martin Snap Scorsese. had that. What? Snap had yeah, that. Snapchat. Filters. It wasn't a it wasn't a Zoom plugin, but it was very easy to apply into Zoom and they took it off the market. And probably because the filmmakers were like, hey. Well, <laughs> here's the thing. You can't call it Tarantino. You call it I have an obsession with feet, you know, and then yeah, you get to no call it. Yeah. All right. I think it's time to move on to the next question, but a good one, David. Thank you. Uh, ne next question is from Fred Parr in Kent, Washington. And Fred asks, what are some good suggestions for a mic for a fitness training video? The talent will not be do doing very strenuous workouts, so, I, so it doesn't need to be uh, very robust. And the company will be paying for it, so a few price ranges would be appreciated. So there are tons of head-worn microphones out there. In this particular case, when somebody's doing aerobics, you, they pretty much need to be hands-free and wireless. So those are the first two things. You don't want to constrain them with any kind of cabling, particularly if they're doing active exercise, because they'll trip and fall, and you don't want that. Um, but there's a lot of different models, um, and there's a lot of different price ranges. The fact that you're getting the mic capsule really close to them should 
uh, do a lot of the work for you. So you don't need a super fabulous microphone in there. That alone will help them be clear to the audience listening. Um, maybe Alex has some specific model things. I know that your wife yeah. does that sort of thing and maybe you bought those. She doesn't do what, what fitness. My, my brother's wife does. <laughs> so ah, I, okay. I can tell you my, my, my brother's wife does yoga uh, online. And, uh, and I know that what she's using is relatively cost effective. So it's a... Um, uh, it is just a pile mic with a that goes into a um, Rode Go, and that has been working for her since COVID started. Um, there are a lot of different headsets. The the company that probably does the most fitness headsets, is sure. Um, oops, sorry, hit the wrong button there. Um, is like here's an example of one. This is one of the Sure headsets. You know, and you can get ones that are all black. Um, this is the uh, SM31 FH. Uh, and and this is but this is one of many and and sure has a whole range that started about 60 bucks and goes all the way up to this is a really an area they focused on a lot um, and so that is a um, you know they have lots of different headsets there you know what you're looking for is again if you're in a quiet space you may want to look for an omnidirectional headset mic as opposed to it and these are this is pretty rugged um, you know so you could also go I mean if it if you want it to be lower profile um, you might want to go towards um, a Countryman H6 or a DPA 4066. Those are going to be a lot more expensive, uh, but they are going to be lower profile and give you a higher quality audio than some of the fitness mics. The fitness mics are really designed to be have a lot of off-axis rejection because you're in a. They're assuming a lot of times that you're in a space where there's open speakers playing a lot of loud music and you're still getting everybody excited, and the quality isn't as important. As you start to go up that range, they start to worry less and less about that and work more about quality. But you still may want to look for the low profile, again, a DPA 66 or an H or a, 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 a Countryman H6. Both omnidirectionals are going to sound really, really nice, and they're not going to look. They're not going to have a, a, a strong look on there, so it, it feels more natural there. Agreed that you need to go to a transmitter. You, you can decide what quality of transmitter that you need. Um, you know, there's uh, you know those those Shures will go into a lot of different things. In the environment that you're in, in an exercise area, you probably don't need more than a Sennheiser, uh, you know, 100. Um, it's probably not something that's going to, it's probably going to sound just fine, you know, if you if you set it up correctly. If someone else is paying for it and they really want best in the best, think of the sound devices, uh, A20 series or the Electrosonics are going to be great. Uh, it's probably more than you need, <laughs> but... But, you know, knock yourself out. So anyway, so, uh, you know, so the um, so those are other things that you can um, look at at different price, price points there. Um, I will say that this is a this is an area where your little, um, you know, road goes and the and the uh, and the DJIs and so on and so forth are probably going to work fine, you know, because you can you can get that that receiver somewhere they need to be, um, you know, so that's in the cost effective two or three hundred dollars for the transmitter range. Again, if you just want something that you never want to explain to your client why something washed out, you always want it to work every single time, then you're going to go up that range. If you're, especially if you're going to do a lot of fitness videos, a lot of times you want something a little bit more rugged and a little le more stable so that you never have to think about it. And that's where you start thinking about, again, the higher insurers, the, the ULXs, the, the um, you know, there's, and there's lots of transmitters in those areas that will do plenty good inside of a fitness environment. So anywhere from three hundred dollars to $3,000 per channel is, is um, available to you there. Alex has covered almost all of it. The only other thing I'd just a note about, the terminations on these, there's a variety, TA4S, TA5Fs, uh, 3.5 millimeter. So just make sure that whatever transmitter and receiver system that you buy, that your headset mic will probably be orderable in the correct termination to fit in with your transmitter. So just pay a little of attention to that as you're going down the road. Let's go to the next question. Uh, next question is from Kern in Maine. And, uh, and Kern's question is, uh, I had the opportunity to catch U2's show at the Sphere. Uh, does the OH crew have any insights on how the turntable stage they performed on works? Not just the lighting up, but displaying the live video. It's fascinating tech. This is interesting to me. So, Alex, have you done any studying on the Sphere we, stage? There are some folks that watch the show. If you're listening, uh, we'd love to have you on. Um, that have you know that have mentioned a little bit about some of those things um, uh, off the record. And so hopefully uh, we might be able to get some folks from the team on. Uh, I'm, I'm hesitant to say anything that I've talked about there, but but I think that um, it, it's spared no expense. Like it's the most amazing uh, space for, you know, that, that's been created in the world right now. Like it, it is just a, when you talk to anyone that's touched any part of that, it was just an, everything was hard. Like everything was hard. 
and everything took new tech and everything you know was built and so hopefully we can get more there's some behind the scenes videos that are pretty good um i don't know if they've, they've covered um all the details there they probably haven't but um, we'll see if we if we can't do something maybe even during nab we'll see if, maybe if we can't send a crew over um, we'll, we'll work on that chris fenwick well, let me hit my hardware mute here. Uh, so I do know this about the turntable. The turntable is actually the, some of the older tech in the whole thing. I think that turntable actually belongs to Brian Eno or something. And it's and it's uh, technology that predates the sphere. I, that's all I know. Wow, that's interesting. You know, there used to be a theater that I grew up with in Phoenix called the Celebrity Theater that had a rotating stage. It was theater in the round. And I used to, every time I went to see a show there, and I saw Marvin Gaye and David Bowie and a whole bunch of people in that relatively small theater. But I always was a little anxious because I thought, what if all the cable gets twisted too far and they have to turn the stage in the other direction? And they did, in fact, in some shows, start it in one direction and then maybe 45 minutes into the show change direction so i don't know if they've solved all those problems but theater in the round to me is fascinating and a rotating stage adds another layer of complexity and interest so i would love to learn more about this let's go on to the next question next question is from david brady in new york new york and david asks trying to grok what is meant by thunderbolt usb quote unquote lanes uh, can anyone provide a graphic example, uh, maybe using uh, system information to help kickstart my understanding? Jeffrey Powers wants to take a swing at this, David. Or um, I, I can explain it. I, I don't have the ability to uh, switch to graphics, but uh, the whole the whole point is that a lane, uh, you know, the fi five year explanation is it's like uh, you can say the highway. I always like to say a big room with multiple doors that you can go in and out. Uh, Thunderbolt cables provide what's called super speed pairs, and you can have two or four in a Thunderbolt cable. Now, it's they're using the PCIe architecture. Uh, in Thunderbolt 4's case, it's PCIe 3.0, which is about one gigabit per second. The newer and Thunderbolt 4, and then now, of course, Thunderbolt 5 will be using PCIe i.e. 4.0, which will be about 2, 2 gigabit per second to bring up 240 watts or um, uh, 240 watts or 120 gigabits per second in speed. And of course, that's all configured through the cable and the little chip that's that uh, comes through uh, at the ends of the cable to uh, bring things back in and out. So hopefully that explains everything a little bit better. Uh, I can draw up a graphic for you, but just think of it, like I said, a room with uh, four different doors. Go Chris Henwick? Oh, sorry. So, uh, yeah. Uh, David, here's what I know. I know that I can't plug, if I plug two 5K monitors into one port, I try and daisy chain them, it, it, it doesn't work. So, if, but if I put one 5K monitor into the port that's two away from it, I'm talking about the studio in particular. So there's two in the back, or there's four in the back and two in the front. Um, I could do two 5Ks. Now, I think you can you can daisy chain 4Ks. I don't have any 4K monitors. I have 5K monitors. Uh, but so the the what's the word you said? The lanes. I think it's 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 almost. I'm gonna guess it's like a chip per lane or something like that. Like this runs this stuff, and this can do it's this much stuff, and these can do this much stuff. It's a pair of send and receive connectors. So each one, each lane. That's has, what I would have said a, too. Has a send and receive uh, connector. So there's four pairs of those uh, send and receive uh, connectors there to make that possible. Jeff Cohen wants to get on this. Jeff. And, and I've been uh, oh, there you are. yeah, yeah, and I've been searching, trying to find something that I think perhaps uh, at least visually uh, simplifies it and. Um, you know, piggybacking on, on what's been said, but the important thing to keep in mind with why they talk about lanes and then ports, if you see this graphic on screen, is that, and similar to what uh, Chris was saying, is if you think of it as lanes on a highway, if we only have one lane and we're putting all the cars in that one lane, it's going to be congested. Um, and Alex has, has talked about here and on MacBreak Weekly about ports. He wants all the ports on his studio versus an air that has two ports, for example. So they are physically distinct highways or paths back to the system on a chip and everything else. And so you each connection is less congested and can do th more things in parallel. 
Jeffrey Powers. You want to come back in? And just to uh, to answer Chris's query there, and basically once uh, once we start moving to Thunderbolt Five, you'll be able to do uh, more than uh, a daisy chaining, more than just uh, 4K monitors. It can go up to 8K monitors uh, with uh, Thunderbolt Five. David Brady, thank you for the question. Let's move on to our next one. Next question is from Clive Kitchener uh, in, um, in in Souk, British Columbia, Canada. And Clive asks, uh, any good reason why audio levels of podcasts are remarkably inconsistent, too loud or too low? Uh, aren't decibels a universal measurement? Jeff Cohen. They are. And that's not really what's being used in the sense of if you think of the traditional peak decibels and that's very different than what the specs call for so uh the specs right now here's an example on screen of even the platforms can agree and they're calling for a uh, loudness measured in luffs which is really a measurement of perceived volume uh in other words how does it sound and so something may have different peak decibel levels but could sound about the same it, when measured in luffs. And that's a whole separate conversation. Higher frequencies will tend to sound louder than lower and so on. And, and so likewise, I was trying to find something that might quickly uh, visually explain this. If you see this graphic on screen, um, going to the bottom. So you see there's just a couple of these little stray peaks hitting this negative one dB true peak. So even though it's only a few of these little strays, this audio file is hitting peak negative uh, one. But if you see this uh, kind of loose audio here, and then this one section that's very dense, if these were different files, this dense section would sound way louder and would have a higher LUFS. And so that's why they use LUFS now. Jeffrey Powers. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, decibels are universal me measurement, but microphones aren't. And, uh, you know, I, I was just going through some of my old stuff and the microphones I used to use uh, for doing my shows. And I'm kind of glad that YouTube doesn't have any type of normalization on their uh, system, because if you would have normalized some of that audio that I did back then, it would be so hard to hear. And it's hard to hear to begin with, but now it's going to be loud and really crackly and, and just a whole bunch of junk that comes through. So I'm really glad that they're not doing any type of normalization. And of course, on the same token, they try to put any type of echo cancellation or anything like that on there you might lose the whole show so i'm glad that they keep it as it is and yeah you're gonna suffer through a couple things but uh, i would rather not have them try to change it alex the the, the the real issue again and this is mentioned in the there's not a lot of professionals mixing their own podcast there's a podcast for almost every person in the united states and um, not all of them are audio engineers and so they um so they do the best they can uh, we're usually happy that they used a professional mic uh you know so if they, you know and and you know like that that's a huge step forward for broadcasters oftentimes not to be rough about it but it's really hard to listen to most of most podcasts i would say uh, 90 to 95 percent of podcasts are completely unlistenable um, and um, and then so that's why that you end up with a five percent which is still a lot of podcasts because there are so many <laughs> so so anyway um, but I think that one of the things that um, again is is listening to those things and, and li listening to loudness uh, uh, Nigel mentioned in you know, on, you know in our uh, chat that you know the um, our show is a little lower the reason our show is a little lower going into YouTube at least is that we lower it we we have our mics because we work pretty hard to be pretty close to, to each other. I think that we're probably closer than most shows. Um, but part of that is, is that we, we lowered the requirement. When we had the requirement a little louder, there were some people who came in that couldn't get to that number. Um, and so then we had this problem with, you know, they just couldn't get to the, that loudness number with the mic that they had. And so we lowered it a little bit so that it would, it would go across that and not be a, be a problem. Um, and so, so, but I do think the other thing is, is that a lot of, a lot of podcasts aren't very compressed. So one of the ways that, uh, you know, and, and we can talk, there's a lot of discussion about compression, but, um, oftentimes if you have stuff a little bit of further apart, you can pull it together a little bit by a, you know, gentle compression of two to one or three to one, where you just kind of pull things together a little bit and you can pull all those mics together. It's a relatively quick way to, um, grab things and, and have them all kind of feel like they're part of the game. You don't want to 
jack it up too hard uh, or reach down too deep. But but you can kind of blend things together a little bit more effectively with a little bit of overall compression at the end. Jeff Cohen, you want to come back? I'll just add real quick that, you know, the platforms will, YouTube included, they will lower uh, the loudness. They will not increase it. So YouTube, for example, if you upload a file that is too loud above what the specs allow, they will lower it. But if you're too low, and like Alex said, depending on who's actually creating that final file and uploading it, people, you know, will just they don't understand how to set that final loudness so it's all over the map and the platforms will not bring it up they'll just bring it down mr fenwick you know i'm not an expert but i do have a microphone in front of me which means people will listen but i think the issue is first of all jeff uh i think it's super interesting that even the platforms can't agree on what their target luffs is also alex i think that the reason some people couldn't hit uh, uh, above 24 is that to get into those kind of ranges, it's more than just gain out of the mic because you're going to have transient peaks and stuff. And I think at a certain point, the compression has to happen so that the overall gain can be pushed up. Because if, if I have the highest, if my highest stuff is here and my lowest stuff is here, and then I compress it all, then I can boost it all up. And now I yeah. can get it right up at the ceiling like that. I mean, it's and just I think it's, I think until we send a compressor to everybody's house and we don't want to just, uh, just use, uh, just a, I think it's a good, it's a solid preamp that <laughs> we can send a real preamp to everybody. It's there's the, the, you know, you, you know, we, we don't need to, I think that, that there, I mean, like a, I'm not compressing the signal that I'm sending out to everyone right now from my mix pre, it just has a preamp that, that has enough, uh, power to, to bring this mic up. Like it's not, I'm just it's gonna, not a compress, oh. it's not, it's not compressing it you know, to, to do that. It's just simply, it, there's enough there. And so the problem is, is that, you know, lower quality preamps are not going to, you know, lower quality preamps are going to just bring noise in with them. Um, and that's the, that's the challenge. I mean, that's what I will, that's what I will argue anyway. <laughs> so, and I'm going to come in as somebody who's been doing a lot of audio book reading, which means I sit at a desk every single day and do a long period. I am shocked when I go into post at how inconsistent my levels are. And this is from somebody who's been in front of microphones for 40 years. I know how to announce, I, but my voice changes, my energy changes, uh, groups of days are similar, and then I will have outlier days when I just sound different. Maybe I have a little cold or something, and it just drops my energy down. Trying to get all of that to sound consistent over the course of a book has been an interesting challenge and requires a lot of engineering intervention you know, on my I, part to make it work. My problem is it's not, it's so different between them. Like when we turn on YouTube on Apple TV, I have to like turn down the volume because it is, mm -hmm. YouTube is dramatically louder than, than everything else, you know, because they just, they just, it's as loud as it can make it. <laughs> you know, I think, so Clive, I think, I think the answer is this is hard to be yeah. completely consistent across audio on platforms. It's just a tough battle and we all work hard at getting it done, particularly here at this show. We work, spend a lot of time on our audio. Let's move on to the next question. Next question is from Douglas Carmichael, and Douglas asks: uh, In the marketing for ABBA Voyage, they mentioned tour out. Uh, they mentioned for out of five uh, ILMs, Global Studios were used along with anywhere from five hundred to a thousand artists. How do you manage a large work group? I imagine a um, hundred, one hundred to five hundred person Zoom meeting. <laughs> would get chaotic. <laughs> I would imagine it would. I just remember back to our early days here when sometimes we had panelists that went off one screen and we had 20. And managing 30, 40, 50 people is really hard in a Zoom car. I call Nigel. Uh, yes, it is very hard to do a uh, five to a thousand person. Um, I think we proved that. The reality is I think we have to separate out two different issues here. The second half, which is how do you communicate with the whole team? They may actually never communicate with the whole team. That may never have been a requirement. The reality is when you do that, it's like a broadcast. It's it's much more about keeping everybody uh, globally synchronized on, on progress. Working groups are done at much smaller levels. So most managers would really struggle to manage more than 
10 to maximum 20 people. And so that's how you end up with hierarchies. Uh, Because what happens is the managers need managers that need managers. In fact, if you watch the end of something like an Avengers film, you see see the hundreds or thousands of people, but they're all in groups, and those groups may represent subgroups, and you may just actually be seeing the leaders of those groups, not necessarily the worker bees. So to do something at this level requires A, a management system, and B, some amazing project management. And what's actually interesting when you see ABBA arrive, a voyage if you do, um, right at the very end, a lot of the ILM people actually appear on the screen. So they actually give them a little bit of, whether it's just the stop motion capture people, I don't know. But the uh, the people are captured and they're included at the end, the very, the very end of uh, the thing, because they're rendered to look like they were in the 70s. They come on as they are today to thank everybody. And then the whole ILM team or a large amount of the ILM team is then visible on the screen. But you can't you can't manage at that level. You have to manage using a management structure and project management. Alex. So I used to work at ILM. Uh, we had about, and on Star Wars, we had uh, approximately 1,200 artists working on the film at one time. Uh, and exactly how Nigel said that most of us were in, I think the division that I was, the group I was in was about 10 or 12 people. And we had our own, uh, you know, we had a person that was managing a couple groups like ours. Um, and then we had a coordinator or a couple coordinators. We had a coordinator for our space that, that she was the one that kind of went around every day to make sure, to ask us how we were doing and talk about our deadlines and all those other things and where we were to make sure that she knew what that was. And that would go into a database. Um, there was a, some overall coordinators that that dealt with specific scenes. So here's the scene that this coordinator is managing, and that coordinator would talk to our coordinator <laughs> to talk about where things were, and then sometimes we interact with them as well. Um, and then we had, you know, for for us, you know, we would go into a theater and watch our dailies with a lot of other people. So we, if you had a if you had something you were working on that you could see there, you'd go into dailies and watch those and get. And there was a power to having everyone see everybody else's work because it coordinated the visual effects supervisor and the director didn't have to tell everybody the same thing over and over and over again. So if we're all sitting in a theater and we're all watching them and say, hey, let's not do this, or hey, let, you know, there's other people that are doing some of the similar things. And so so those are the those were the some of the things that we kind of had to work through there. Um, things that were really important were A, that we had clear ideas of what needed to be done, B, naming conventions and processes and reporting structures and those types of things become really, really important because you know, a lot of times, for instance, you have one group of people that are doing the animation. So you have the motion capture getting cleaned up and being added. You have the people cleaning that motion data up and really doing a lot of hand animation on top of that. You have the people who are doing the simulation for the clothes. You have the people who are doing the skin simulations and the muscles. You have people who are doing, who are building all the blend shapes that make all of that work. You have people who are just doing the hair. You have people who are just doing, you know, like just doing the face. Uh, there might be a group of people that are just doing the faces. It might be two or three people per 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 actor that are just working on that thing and they have to work very closely. So everybody's got their own little bit of this. And what's amazing about an industrial light and magic is that it can go and grab all of that information and pull it together when it needs to render, you know, so when it needs to render that out and put it together. So when, when, when I was there, it's gotten a lot more advanced, you would say, um, you know, grab the latest simulation of Jar Jar, grab his latest textures, grab the latest lighting for the scene, grab the scene, grab the, grab the animation, grab the texture, you know, all these things that would just grab all of them and it would start spitting out frames. Nobody working on it saw any of that together until we went to dailies, which was sometimes hilarious because the you'd have this perfectly rendered thing of Jar Jar as an example, but the simulation broke on his ears, and so they're just like flying all over the place and, and doing all this other stuff, but no one knew that until they got there. <laughs> and it was because the animation on Jar Jar did, broke something in the sim like when the simulator was working and the guy's moving it back and forth and going oh yeah it looks fine until the animation was applied and then it threw off you know something like the nodal points or something like that so so the point is is that it's it just a it's a um it, it is it takes a lot to get it done and there's only a handful of companies in the world ILM probably being the best at it um but but there's only a handful of companies in the world that can manage something that needs five uh 500 to a thousand artists at one time and that's why it's one of the reasons you go to ILM to have that kind of thing done I think we're moving to the next question. Next question is from Paul Wallows in uh, Austin, Texas. And Paul asks, a friend writes, he recently watched a short film uh, that was shot on two Ultra 24 cameras with cheap gimbals and a cheap $150 anamorphic lens. And it looked like it was done on Hollywood grade Aries. Uh, Comment on the Samsung Ultra 24. 
We're going to start with Jeffrey Powers here. Jeffrey. Yeah, it's 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 amazing what we can do with phones. And in fact, we've been doing it for over 10 years now. I was watching a show, and if, that was 2013. I know Filmic Pro is over 10 years old. So we've been uh, we've been working and trying to get this uh, better and better. And now with these phones like the S24 Ultra, which is kind of like the iPhone 50. 15 Ultra Max, uh, you can get your your basic uh, wide shot is about 200 megapixels, uh, whereas the uh, the ultra wide shots 12 megapixels, and then the tellies tellies are uh, 50 megapixel. They got 3x optical zooms inside the lenses, uh, and then they got what's called the space zoom, which is 100x. But there was a little bit of question that happened last year when people were taking pictures of the moon and they were finding that the, that they, the picture they took was blurrier than the actual model and it was thought that they were using AI models to kind of enhance your picture of the moon. So I'm not sure how they've resolved that, if they're still doing that for any type of uh, stuff on Samsung. Uh, but yeah, it, it's it, I wouldn't be surprised in the next five years. A lot of people uh, will be using these uh, phones for a lot of productions. The only thing that it misses is the uh, the ability to switch out uh, lenses to stuff uh, that have very specific needs for what you're doing for film, and that's where something like a DSLR or an Airy would come into play. Alex. <laughs> that's what Jeffrey said. The only thing it's missing is the, is the ability to adjust lenses. Like every cinematographer was like, yeah, that's the only thing that I want <laughs> from the camera. And so, you know, so, so like that's the only thing I need. Um, the, I, you know, I think that it's incredible what's happened with these cameras. You know, so the Ultra 24 going head to head with the iPhone 15. And, and there's a new, I think, behind this great behind the scenes. I think we should open up another Thursday where we talk about it. But there's some great behind the scenes. Um, uh, um, the stuff that Apple's showing from the new Japanese film that was shot is like a 20 minute short film. And for short films, um, for, uh, independent, fi some, maybe some independent films, these are great solutions, you know, to, to kind of get yourself off the ground and everything else. But I would not say that a ultra 24 camera, uh, looks the same as an airy in public. Like it is not, you know, like it, it's not, it's not the same. And anybody who, Anybody who works in film, when you say that, they're going to stop listening to you, you know, and it's not because they're being snobby or whatever. It's because they don't look the same and especially that they don't look the same in all environments. It's everything looks good in a sunny day, but that's a very different thing than looking good in, in an entire production, you know, and being able to have the, the tools that you need and the range that you need. And, the t and, and it's not just a matter of the sensor. It's how you get to the sensor. It's how you set those things up. It's how you integrate with the rest of the production. These are great and they're breaking ground and we're going to keep on seeing them get there, but we're not there yet. <laughs> we should not, you know, we should not overstate. It, it, it undermines our position as filmmakers and as content creators to overstate the quality of something that is way better than it was in the past, but not the same. <laughs> like, you know, not the same as an Airy, uh, not the same as a Venice, not the same as a Blackmagic uh, film camera. You know, like the, the the cinema cameras. I mean, I would if you said you get to use a a um, you can shoot the next film with your Blackmagic uh, 6K or with a with a, um, uh, a a Samsung. I'll pick the Blackmagic 6K every single day. You know, like because of all the extra tools and the, and the quality of the record and everything else. And so, and those are roughly the same price, by the way. <laughs> you know, so the, the roughly the same price camera, except one can make phone calls, um, which we don't do anymore because this is the new new thing, right? Is not to make any phone calls. So, so the um, anyway, I don't. Th I think we just want to be very careful of this kind of people get excited, and usually, what when someone says it looks just like a an Airy, you just feel like their eye isn't there. Like they don't do this very often. Like their eye isn't there. They're not seeing the difference. They're not. You know, you just go okay. And, but but you get when you say that. You get put into a little box when you're talking to filmmakers like they actually don't know what they're talking about because they've never – it's not like they they don't like you. They just know that you have never – you haven't done very much of this yet, you know, and and they treat you, <laughs> treat you like a film child. Like, oh, it's, it's okay, Chris. <laughs> it's okay. You know, like you're a creative. It's okay, Alex. And I, I was like that early on. I had a X, EX1 and I was like, it's 1080p. It's the same as these Grass Valley cameras. And it only took me a couple of productions to realize that I should just keep my mouth shut. 
because uh, the difference between an EX1 and, and a Grass Valley at the time were dramatic, you know, and, and I was a fool, you know, and, and so I've learned this from, you know, my own experience that you don't want to overstate the technology and say it's just like, be very, very careful about saying it's just as good as, you know, something much more expensive. It may be better bang for your buck. That, you know, that's, that might be, it may be good enough for what you're shooting. It may be able to produce a film that you could, you could get into the Academy, but don't try to say that it's the same as an Airy or a Venice or even a, you know, even a, a black magic camera. They're not, not yet. <laughs> Chris, you wanted to defend this yourself? Comment from, yeah, uh, this comment from Paul was part of the reason why earlier I joked about, I don't know what I'm talking about, but I'm sitting in front of a microphone. You got to be really careful when you read things or you hear a review or something, you have to check the source. You have to check the source. Alex is dead right. If somebody says it looks exactly the same, I'll be honest with you. They don't know what they're talking about. And I'm not trying to be rude. I'm not trying to be judgmental. I'm just telling you the truth. They just don't know what they're talking about. So be careful who you listen to. I will 100% with, agree with everything that's said. That's, that's been my experience as well. I will say, though, there is one little twist here that I've run into, which is a lot of those people at the top didn't understand that the delta between the top and the mid-range bottom or the upper range bottom was slowly changing and shortening. And I'll never forget the day that I heard one of my friends who was saying, I would never, ever, ever, ever use a DSLR. You would need real cameras and that. They had to do a crash cam. And sure enough, they started using 5D Mark IIs back in those days, and they could access, acceptably get there. They hadn't even considered that before. So again, 100% in agreement with at the top end. And the tools that do the best do the best. And there is a distinct difference between those tools and the tools below it. What you also have to keep an eye out, though, is that you don't get so arrogant that you don't start keep looking at the, the, the innovation at the low end and find when it just gets cracks in enough so that it's a tool that can be used to good effect along with the bigger stuff. Alex, you had some thoughts? Yeah, it's interesting to your point there uh, that – uh, when we go to, for our NAB coverage, which we'll talk about next week a little bit more, um, we are, you know, using pretty traditional cameras for the, for the booth and pretty traditional cameras for the live feeds that are going out. But all the coverage that I'm planning to do of NAB outside of the live coverage um, is all going to be on my phone. <laughs> you know, and it has been. And here's the funny thing is I've used my phone for this for 10 years. Like it was, I got very quickly, like for the kind of coverage that I was doing for these events, I was like, it's not worth it. It's not worth picking up that camera and dealing with all that footage and dealing with all those things. I can just pick up my phone and get a mic in there and, and run it with a rig. And it was way easier. And you're going to see, uh, not next week, but the week after, I'll do a, some phone stuff. I'm doing phone in stereo at GDC. <laughs> so I'm going to be using the spatial camera on the Apple, Apple phone for that. So I think that it's there. But we have to also remember that people do react to it. Um, you know, they're having a hard time getting people to show up at theaters. But if you look at the new Dune, the 1570, that's the big IMAX format, is effectively sold out in, at the Metreon for the entire run. Like I went to go buy some tickets and you cannot get good seats at all. <laughs> like they're, you know, so, so people are, you know, there are, there's a group of people that are definitely looking for that higher end. In fact, I think that if the theater market changes dramatically. What's all that's going to be left is the really high end. Like in the, everything else will go to streaming. So it's the IMAX 1570s, it's the Dolby uh, cinemas, and everything else I don't think competes with an 85-inch screen TV and a 7.2 system at home. Chris Fenwick, you wanted to come back in? Tip of the bell curve. Um, Alex, uh, you mentioned the phone. Since we're talking about phone production here, uh, earlier, I think it was earlier this week, you showed those stickers that the cr that the creators are using with their phones to do horizontal yeah. and vertical. Did you figure out whether or not they're using front and rear yeah, cameras I mean, for yeah, that? I got to, I got to, I got to, I'll, I'll ask one of them. I, I couldn't figure out like, well, I think they're just, just using one. You had, of one you had one thing to do <laughs> and you have nothing for us. I, I don't even think you're really serious about this show anymore. In all Alex. your spare time, Alex, how did exactly you not get that? <laughs> how do I figure out how to use these suction cups? I need you to so, step it up, Lindsay. Yeah. All right, let's go to the next question. Next question is from Zach uh, Jeffers in the great uh, PNW, um, Pacific Northwest. It took me a second to get the Pacific Northwest there. Sorry, Jeff, or Zach. Um, uh, the question is, 
in need of a quick solution to pro, um, providing multi-view uh, to 50 of 50 SRT feeds. Uh, it's used as a status indicator for SRT feeds. Um, I can't seem to get OBS on AWS or the like to stay stable. Any idea on building multiple 5x5 or larger grids in the cloud? And nothing like a good technical question, and Alex is going to take this on. Alex, dive in. I got an answer. It's a turnkey Yay. system, VBCR. <laughs> so, so VBCR is what you're looking for. Uh, if you go to livex.tv slash tags slash VBCR, we did a we did an event we did a show with them a second hour uh, with Corey um, Benke. So, so check that out. Um, but the uh, is VBCR is what you're what you're looking for, and it will do exactly what you're trying to do. Beautiful. Chris Fenwick, you had a thought? There's another service. I can't remember what it's called. Keenan would know. He builds these dashboards for uh, uh, event, you know, uh, natural disasters and events mm -hmm. where people need to, to monitor a bunch of feeds all at once. Right. And he fires up a thing and he can break it into, I don't know if he can do five by five. I think right. he can. It seems like a lot. And he just, he applies a URL to each one boom. And then they have a, a dashboard that's running for the duration of their event. Like I need to follow the, the local weather and the police reports and the whatnot and everything. And so they're in their, you know, uh, command centers out at the hurricane location and they can watch everything all at once. Uh, I will try and find the name of that. Really cool service. And Zach said cool. that he also needs, he said he, he needs, ECR does HLS grids, he needs a non-browser grid. I would reach out to LiveX and talk to them before I made other decisions because they do a lot of different formats. What it has on the website and what it can do are, you know, very different things. It can, it's a pretty pliable thing that they, de, they deliver. So um, I would also look at that. Uh, I would talk to, I would talk to them before I decided it couldn't do it. Zach, thanks for the question. Let's get to our next one. Uh, next question is from Edwin Ruiz in Chicago, and Edwin asks, recently upgraded to uh, an M3 MacBook Pro and wondered why, how many HDMI feeds or wondered how many HDMI feeds I could run out of Zoom ISO. This would be for travel, so no external deck link, purely dongles. Jeffrey Powers. Jeffrey? Well, the problem is that uh, even though the M3 chip is there, it's still running on the Thunderbolt 4 uh, sp uh, specification for uh, your external uh, ports. So I've always, uh, at the most, uh, when I had my M1 hooked up with the pluggable uh, dongles, uh, I could get, plus the HDMI, I could get five different uh, 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 feeds out of there. Uh, Alex. And one suggestion from one of our viewers uh, is uh, a great option. This is a great option for Zoom ISOs to go with the Ultra Studio Monitor 3G. Uh, gives you one SDI or HDMI output for Zoom ISO, and it sees it like a deck link uh, with embedded audio. Uh, keeps, he keeps one in his backpack. Oh, there you go. Hopefully that helps, Edwin. Let's go to the next question. Next question is from Mike Edwards in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, morning, everyone. Uh, what tablet mount for iPad uh, and Wacom does the panel recommend that swivels, uh, is capable and comfortable to draw on, and can withstand actual pressure? If you go uh, and search mounts, you will see a lot of companies that make various. A, a lot of them are too lightweight, particularly if you're going to use touchscreen things. I know Alex has one that he uses every day. But I have always, if I'm looking for something really stable, uh, lent myself toward RAM mounts. They are a company that makes mobile mounting solutions, and they are a pretty big contractor with uh, – emergency vehicle kind of groups. They have a lot of their mounts in police cars and things like that. So it has to be very stable and very reliable. Usually it's much more robust than some of the other mounts that I said. But Alex, what are your thoughts about this? Uh, I have, uh, as you can see, I have three of these ones because, you know, and if someone asks like, do you really own these? You can see on Amazon that I purchased it three times, most recently in February. Um, so these are the uh, Huanuo uh, 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 arms and they are very robust. Um, this is what I'm drawing on right now. This is a Wacom tablet, a, Wa uh, a Wacom tablet on one. I actually have a, uh, it's got a metal plate connected to it where I have a uh, Stream Deck XL uh, attached to that plate. So it's carrying both of those things. It is very stable. I can sit there and tap on it. It's not doing anything. It's not going anywhere. Uh, it is very adjustable. You can loosen it or tighten it, but I keep it pretty tight so that it has the the strength that I need. Um, and so um, I got to tell you, I 
what really pushed me over the edge with this is that it was just another ARM company that happened to be less expensive. This one is the most robust one at 120 bucks. You can get ones for 60 bucks that handle less weight. Um, and it was just less than the Amazon ARMs I was buying. What really got me over the hump of, of hiring, buying stuff from this company specifically is I lost one of the little C-clamps and I emailed them. I bought a whole nother one just so I get the C-clamp, but I was like, oh, maybe I get another C-clamp for this one too. And I, uh, um, and I emailed them to the support and they got back to me in a, in a minute and they said, just take a picture of it. And I took a picture of it and they said, I don't know, it'll be 15 bucks. I like, literally, I think they made something up on their website so I could send them $15 and then they sent it to me, you know, and I just got it last night and now it's in here. And, and then they, but as soon as it arrived at my house, they, they pinged me and said, Hey, did you get the C, did you, did you get the C clamp? <laughs> Like, I, mean, I kid you not, like minutes after it arrived, my customer house, service. They asked, they asked, oh. And I was like, so it's, it, it feels like a random, you know, Chinese company that's there, but wow. Like I was blown. I mean, I haven't had that kind of customer service from a lot of American companies of them just really asking, hey, did you get everything you needed? Did it work? Did it, you know, are you happy with it? You know, it was just really, really uh, amazing service and very, very solid arm. They have a lot of different ones and I, I use, I probably use three or four different kinds of their arms. Jeffrey Powers. First of all, Alex, you got to put that link in the in the show notes and see how fast we sell out on that. Um, so, mm -hmm. the big thing for me, uh, of course, Wacom has their their arm, uh, but the one thing that I found that is a lot of these arms, especially if you got an iPad that has a case attached to it, uh, they don't support the cases, and that's the most frustrating thing when it comes to finding uh, trying to find stuff. If you're looking for something table mounted, that's what Alex su suggested going. But if you want something that's freestanding on its own. I would highly suggest uh, taking a look at some of these music stands and uh, uh, extra uh, things for like extra percussion. Uh, they're over in the music, music section. You get a really nice stand, three legs, and then of course a flat table that does a little bit of tilting so you can angle it to what you want. And some of them do swivel uh, by just simply uh, tightening or loosening one bolt and you'll be able to move it around. Let's go to the next question. Next question is from Chris Widener in Indianapolis, Indiana. And Chris asks, if all you had was an iPhone to capture yourself speaking, what minimal kit would you bring with you? A uh, USB-C capture card like the Streamer X for pass-through capture and a Rode uh, Pro mic paired with a Streamer X? Uh, Jeff Cohen. Yeah, now, um, you know, you didn't specify, I, I would assume, the use case is your on the road, you're out, you're out in the field. Um, one thing I wanted to point out um, real quick is what software to use. And because I've tried a lot of these uh, specifically for recording on the phone and Apogee, Rhodes app, at least last time I checked and I just took a quick look, is is pretty bare bones. But Apogee has audio, uh, video and audio because I think he's looking for video as well. Like I think he's trying to capture with a phone like he's it's a cap he's looking for a capture card i think he he's says looking for capture both. yourself speaking what minimal if all you had was an iphone to capture yourself speaking what minimal kit would you bring usb let's, capture let's, card let's put that one on ice and have chris tell us what you're trying to do with that <laughs> like i think that's yeah. confusing and like, where yeah speaks. and where like but are you trying to do video and audio or are you trying to just bring, bring that back another day and we'll we'll give you a more precise answer okay let's slip to the next question here a second we'll do it quick Next question is from Francis Fry in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And Francis asks, uh, which external storage do you recommend for M3 Max MacBook Pro with eight terabytes of internal storage, largely editing 4K video? Alex. Depends on whether you need it to be online, near line, or offline. So if you are going online, like you're going to actually be using that drive while you're editing, um, I would really look at the OWC NVMe. Um, their, their NVMe's, it's, it'll take four NVMe's. I think you can get up to 32 terabytes and it is very fast. Um, uh, so um, so I, would, I would take a look at that. If it's near line, you're looking for some kind of RAID, I'd still probably do either a Pegasus or OWC. And if it's offline, then you start to look at just putting things in. I would put them in, in uh, spinning drives and uh, pair them up so you put a uh, primary backup in there. So those, are the, those would be the ones that I'd consider. Excellent. Well, we are almost at the end of our first hour. A couple of notes. Uh, tomorrow, multi-streaming. We're going to have an overview of how we're preparing the back-end system here at Office Hours to stream simultaneously to multiple platforms. So 
sneak over tomorrow if that's among your interests. Don't forget, we are here on Thursday, and Thursday is always the After Hours Isadora Lab with L. Wilson Spiro, also the Mimo Live Lab with Oliver Breidenbach. So those are two things to be aware of. We have two kind of big initiatives here at Office Hours that are coming up, the eclipse coverage. And so pay attention if you're interested in the eclipse and astrological, or not astrological, astronom- astronomy circumstances. This is the hard science. You'll want to be involved in that. So look on the website for Eclipse coverage. Also our NAB coverage. Alex just mentioned it a moment ago. We're going to have a pretty big crew at NAB and we're going to do our best to bring you all the information and exciting things that are happening at NAB over the course of the next, um, the one that's coming up in just a couple weeks, April 9th. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back to the second hour there. We're almost there. Then we're gone. Then we're here. Then we're gone. Uh, so anyway, so uh, good good to have all of you here. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, auto clipping and um, and really thinking about that as as it relates to um, there. And I'm going to hope, hope that some of our, uh, we've got a couple other people playing with this. I know that Liberty does a fair bit of this as well as I know Jeff's been getting into it as well. Um, so let us know. Go ahead and raise your hand if you'd like to. Um, um, but one of the things that I think that I, I thought it would be useful to show is really you know how we've been playing with it. You'll you'll see some stuff starting and stopping here on our channel um, as we start to um, you know experiment more and more with this auto with auto clipping. Here's the thing that that, that you get into when you start talking about auto clipping and using things like Opus or Descript is you know we produce this, we're a good example and we produce a lot of content. <laughs> like, like I was just talking to someone yesterday and they were like, I can't believe how much content you create every day. Um, so we produce two hours of content. We want to make more of that available to people of, across a, a variety of platforms. And one of the challenges that we have is that how do you go through all that content? Like it is something like how do you go find things um, that, are, that are worth putting in? Now, the best way to do this is to do it by hand is to have people write down markers and go through it and, and you know, clip out the right areas, possibly compress it a little bit and pull some of the video out. Um, but what we have um, found to be more uh, um, efficient you know, to do this is to use things like opus.ai and, and Descript. And I think that a lot of these, we keep on seeing them jump and get better and better and better. And I have to admit that I was, you know, I think we had a lot of people suggesting that we use these for a while. And I was kind of like, oh, it's complicated or, oh, I don't know if I'm going to get anything out there. And um, so I was kind of putting it off. And I finally got to a point where I was like, I'm going to give it a shot. I'm going to I'm going to sit down this this evening and I'm going to walk through all the steps um, to make that possible. So um and it was easy. And what I got out of it was like, oh, that's a pretty good clip. <laughs> like, you know, like that's, <laughs> that's pretty good. Then it's better. Th- and, and again, it is not, is it as good as what I would cut out to do it by hand? No. Is it better than nothing? Absolutely. You know, and, and it is, you know, and I think that it doesn't mean that all of them work. And so um, what I'm going to do now, there's a couple things about the clipping. Now, most of the stuff we've, we've been doing is we've been clipping this stuff for, um, specifically for uh, shorts. So we're aiming uh, for shorts on YouTube. Uh, we may, one of the things I'm thinking about now is clipping things that are designed for TikTok and design. And, and these are very different because, uh, and for better or for worse, TikTok is really focusing on above one minute content and shorts is all below one minute content. So one of the things we've been starting to figure out is that we may have to build, you know, reprocess these twice, you know, to, to get what we want. Um, that's what I'm about to start doing over next week is to start reprocessing a lot of these as a, um, you know, like throw them in once and say, and I'll show you here. Let me uh, grab a, um, let's see here if I can grab a piece here. Let's, um, what happens, by the way, if you're wondering, if I have to host or read, I'm not prepared for the second hour. <laughs> so, 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 so anyway, so like just in just case you're wondering, uh, you know, so so the um, so I can't, I can't, uh, nothing, nothing will get done. So you'll see me work a little bit more from hosting and reading and then having to host something. So then what I do is I sit there and say that and then Liberty raise, raises her hand and, and then I throw it to Liberty. So she can talk for a little while while I get this, this next part of my Julia Child's presentation done. Go ahead, Liberty. Tag teaming, tag teaming. Yeah, exactly, so exactly. yes, as, as Alex said, just I've shared over and over just like snackable content. So things like Opus Clip, um, um, we've been using Descript heavily, um, but then also Vidio. So there's a number of Vidio. If I, I always say like, am how would you I, am compare? I saying, how would you compare Opus to Descript? 
Um, I kind of put them, I, I see oh, uh, Descript as something maybe closer to like an Adobe Premiere than it is with Opus, just with all the AI features, the voice, the, um, you know, being able to um, have someone who's not necessarily technically astute to editing and then being able to use that platform for that. And op- yeah, they're two they're two different categories. Descript has so many more features for your content creation. However, Opus, I look at it more so as like just helping you so much with your SEO and like um I, uh, the your virality score. Like when once Alex pulls um that together and just showing us on the back end of when you are using Opus that it not only is clipping this but it's giving you essentially based on the all the the back end of it what clips should perform well, but not only that they should perform well, the why of it. So what we use that information for is, you know, when we speak about AI, you're the subject matter expert, even though you're getting the the support and the assistance of the AI um, tool. So we'll use it and we'll look, oh, is that accurate? Or maybe there's something that we're seeing trending. I think it was in um, one of our Monday meetings and I had asked, I was like, okay, because we're trying to figure out like some of the, um, some of the clips are like doing well in the thousands and then some of them not so much. And then that just helps you. So this is where I say that Opus is very strong so that you can then figure out just like your content strategy, figure out timing, being able to A-B test. So, and and Alex shared as well, being able to just get the, enough content out because that's a struggle. If you don't get enough content out, you won't be able to necessarily know what's hitting and what's not. And all of this is for the sake of serving your audience. So um, that was a longer <laughs> response to the, you know, just the difference between the two. Descript is much more robust. But if you, and like, I'm all about workflow. So if you want to take Opus clips and take the data and the information you get from Opus to then refine some of the content that you've already got into script, because we use these tools in sync with each other. There's not just like one standalone. There's always different use cases um, when we do actually, when we put them all together. Go ahead, Jeff. And one of the other major distinctions, um, in addition to what Liberty uh said and and I'll show kind of the difference uh in the process because we've uh we've taken the same show and Alex fed it into Opus and I fed it in Descript and we'll look at what it's done. So aside from all the other editing tools, I would say if if you're going to be editing a video, then Descript is a potentially a much more desirable choice because as I'll show the workflow, you take what you've edited and now you generate a full length episode, shorts, et cetera. Um, Today, as of today, Descript gets you really close. It will suggest which blocks of that video would make for good clips, and you can have templates all ready to go for your uh, vertical shorts, and they just haven't hooked the two up yet. But it is formally on their public-facing uh, feature roadmap. It is in development currently already, so they just need to tie those together. Today, the big distinction is Opus, um, aside from maybe the edits Alex will show you, you just give it a whole show. Right, and I'll show you and how it this. will spit out the clips. And, and I'm going to show you how to do and I'm not even, I haven't done it. I haven't cooked it yet. I'm going to cook it right now for you and, and throw this in here. So I'm going to show you what this looks like when you get started. So... Um, so we have a, uh, so what I've and, done And if you is, need something to, to run, Alex, I, you know, we can make, no, no, I have, flip I have it back and forth. Okay. I have it. So, um, so this is a, uh, um, you can see this. Let me just, um, sorry. Uh, and I'm genuinely curious, yeah. by the way, to see which, uh, items so what, of the same show they've recommended. Yeah. So what what they've what what you can see here, and this is just a test feed that we have here. I mean, you can look at it if you want. If you want, to go look at the raw version. It's just a, it's just the same as our show that we had um, before. But what it what it does is no. This is this is the kind of thing we had to start thinking about when we started doing this. So what you're looking at here is this is a um, this is a vertical view. Now what we did what we did here that's different from our show is if you see as we go through this. 
Um, one of the things that's different is we, there's no graphics and it's all just a vertical video. So what, we, what we're doing is we're encoding to YouTube actually a vertical video that is active speaker only. So instead of just grabbing our show, like as we started thinking about this and we started thinking, so we were losing probably 30, 40% of our clips to, multi, to the super source. So the super source or graphics or other things are up there while we're talking. And it's, it's also why we started to become pretty specific about when the super source is up um, is because we, you know, we can't use that. We couldn't use any of those things in the program because it just looks junky. Um, and so, um, so anyway, so we, we were like, okay, well, how do we, how do we fix that? And um, uh, some, some geniuses on the back end um, said, why don't we just do, why don't we feed the out of Zoom ISO, just grab the um, send out uh, just the active speaker and then and then and then we'll cut it as vertical and it tends to look nicer for some, for whatever reason opus doesn't process it the same way anyway and so then we put that out and then we um and that allows us to feed something into opus um that is and it could be the script as well that's already kind of pre-formatted that way um we did test by the way someone said why don't you put it in 16 by 9 let opus try to do an auto move around and so on and so forth but we did, we found that it made it all, take, taking the 16 by 9 and putting it in made it look softer and didn't make any adjustment, didn't seem to make any significant adjustments to what we were doing. Um, so if I go back to here, um, and uh, so I go back to here and I'm just going to put the URL in. I'm not even putting uh, the, um, you know, so now, it's, so now I have this in here. Um, and now what I can tell it is what's the processing time? Auto, zero to three minutes. I'm going to say I want 30 seconds to, I find the less than 30 seconds not useful. I'm building this for shorts. And so I want 30 to 60 seconds. I could say if I wanted longer if I wanted to. Um, this is what we're going to start experimenting with is like 90 seconds to three minutes because that will cover a lot of our answers for our questions in their entirety. Um, but that wouldn't necessarily be good for shorts. Um, and then I could also put in here, you know, keywords and things that I'm looking for to, to grab onto. And now what I'm going to do, it says my credit uses me about two and a half hours. Did we go long? Anyway, we'll see. Um, anyway, the, um, but, uh, and you'll see I have a bunch of credits here that I can add. So I'm going to hit go. And it says, uh, I'm going to be using it for business. Anyway, then I'll ask a bunch of questions. Um, and, uh, but what it'll do is it'll start, it'll go grab that from YouTube. Now, what I was doing before is, and I thought that it would make a difference in quality. Um, but what I was doing before is, uh, um, and here you can see, like, it's now telling me that it's going to, it's analyzing, it'll take about 16 minutes. So we'll talk a little bit, and we'll come back to it. It usually goes a little bit faster than what it says here. Um, so basically what it'll do is it'll send me an email. I, I could, I can upload multiple, like I've done a couple where I just grab a bunch of shows and put them all up there so I can get them all processing in the cloud. They're all going to take about the same amount of time because they're on a server there. And then I go about what I'm doing and I come back. And there'll be a bunch of suggestions that it has there, and you'll get to see those in a second. Uh, go ahead, Chris. Uh, I was good. It's interesting. You kind of uh, glazed over the, and then it asked me some questions from those questions. Oh, those questions. That it's it, not. It's just asking me. I, I don't. It's annoying questions. Um, it's like, who are you, and what are you doing? Is this for YouTube? Is this for you or business or whatever? It, it's not. Those uh, okay. questions aren't sorting questions. They're they're so they're, they're annoying questions that I wish it wouldn't ask. You know, like <laughs> that's why I wasn't showing them to you. It's just like. Oh my I, I got you. So, so do, do we have any clue how this is doing this? Is it is it actually listening to the contextual well, data? Our understanding is, you know, it's using a large language model. So basically, it's 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 converting first the whole thing to a transcript, and then it's finding that it's using that transcript to find things that it's optimizing for. This has got a good because it'll tell you it's got a good hook. It's got you know good. It's topical content. It's got you know. So it it can it's looking for. And in a lot of cases, these have been trained looking at lots of things that did well. <laughs> so you train it by looking at lots and lots and lots and lots of videos, thousands, millions of videos. And, and yeah. if they have a lot of views, you know, they have a lot of hook or they have a lot of stain. You know, it's going to, it's, it, it's figuring that out. And do you find in the target des uh, duration, I almost said destination, in the target duration, that it, uh, what percentage of them have a complete thought in it? As opposed to like, oh, you didn't quite get to the meat of it. Well, in any of the ones where we're answering a, a question that's longer than a minute, it's not the complete thought of what we said. Obviously. But I think that there is a morsel there that you could walk. Again, in some cases, no. It's So I would say that 
like for instance, you'll see that this will produce probably um, 40 things. Like typically what Opus will come back with is about 40 suggestions. Um, and I can show you uh, while it's cooking, we'll go to it. I'll just go to another, um, you know, another one of the, the things here. Hold on. Let me just. I'm the results of, of a previous yeah. scan, so we, if we you will. Look at it. Yeah. And so um, the, uh, how many pop-ups can I give you? Um, all the pop ups, all of them, unlimited all number. Of them. So, but I also, um, to Chris's point, like I also think that it's going back to this the the SEO side of things. Like it, it, it's just like if you were to put something into Google and then it gives you the recommendations, but at the below, you know, way at the bottom of the page, it tells you all the other keywords or topics that people have pulled from. Likewise, when you're when you've put something into Opus or any of these tools, and then it's it's got all of that data to recognize. Okay, here's why this is strong and then you you know you do yeah, as you, you would afterwards and if we look at this for instance this is from our our physical storage um here so uh this one here from and i don't have a way to play the audio so i won't be able to play it right now but it says you know your hook your flow is a minus. you know this is a 99 out of 100 um the hook is uh uh is a minus the flow is a a the engagement is a minus trend is a you know and so so it, it has different ones here and it's grabbing onto those. And then when I when I look at this, I guess I can send it to Premiere. I don't know why you can only send to Premiere, but it has Premiere listed here as an a you can send out an a XML and maybe it they just made it Premiere to be simple. What? Um and so you can send it straight out. Um so it can be exported as and then your text, your captions are being ex um oh, they're exported as overlays. You can't edit them, but they're the text overlays are separate. Um, and then you can, or you can just download it and, um, and that, you know, and then, uh, or just publish it. Now, what I can do is to edit the clip, I can open this up and, um, it's showing me what those, yeah, 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 this is, they, they love pop-ups. All right. Um, oh my gosh. All right. Oh, okay. Um, so anyway, uh, so now you can have it, uh, you can have the auto emojis, which are super annoying. Um, and so you turn those off pretty quickly. Um, and uh, <laughs> they're just the worst. Like, why would you do that? You don't want more anyway, emojis. Maybe I'm too old or something like that. I just, I'm just like, oh, you know. Um, so anyway, so I open this up. And um, now I, I could, I think, um, you know, play with the framing there if I wanted to. But here's, here's what you can see is this text. And so I can go through here and say, um, you know, it says Chris Widener is the next up from Indianapolis and Chris wonders. Now I could, if I wanted to just go, um, uh, I, if I wanted to start with and Chris wonders, I simply select this and say, I want, I want the video to start, um, there. Right. And so I just, so I'm just looking at the text and cutting that out. Now, what I have learned is that I'm not as happy with, um, I am, uh, and you can see here what it's done. Yeah, it's, it's in this case, I uploaded a, a 16 by nine. So it's moved over. Like it's, it's showing you what the overall frame is and where it moved to grab onto bill to ask that question. So it's, it, you know, and you can adjust that if you want to and, and scale it up or down. It, so it's showing you the work that it's done um, to make that actually happen. But you can select all these. I can also do things like I can go, um, I can select, you know, this text here. And just say, yeah, I don't want that part in there. And it'll just cut that out. So now it's going to create an edit and just cut out those things. Now, what I will say is that I'm not super happy with the in, like a lot of times those edits aren't as clean as I'd like them to be. There's a little bit of a, you hear a little bit of a pop that I feel like that could be done, fixed. And now this is 3.0 and I better. haven't tested 3.0, which I'm about to do over this weekend is to test 3.0 and put a bunch of stuff through it. And you'll see a bunch of shorts coming out next week as I, churn through that idea and try to figure those things out. Um, but, uh, but I, so you can cut parts of it out. I can extend it out. Now, one of the things that, that I, um, I have gotten into the, started getting into the habit of doing is leaving a couple extra words. So I go, oh, I actually want to start, set a start here and leave these words. Now here's why is because when I send it to YouTube, I can go into YouTube and use the clip and I can do better than Opus was doing. Like it just that hard, that hard start. Um, that I wasn't happy with, I can figure out exactly where I want to put it, or I could bring it into into Final Cut or into Resolve or whatever, and sit there and and clean up that the way I want to at the beginning and end. Um, I may not want to do that on the internal ones, um, but but that's what I want to do there. And in ca some cases, when you look at this, um, you know you can you can go a little longer, but in some cases it's grabbing things. Not in this one, 
but it can be grabbing, like it can be taking that answer um, and uh, it can take that answer and not, um, uh, it can take that answer from a lot of different things you said. Like it'll clip things together. Like it'll look at your answer and pull things out of it and suck some, you know, to try to get more energy out of it. And so it, it does. So anyway, so you end up with these kind of, you know, lots of, you know, you, you end up with, in this case, it, it grabbed 40, you know, typically is like 40, you know, is, is the crazy. number that you usually get to. Out of the 40, I typically, um, if I look at them all, I typically find six to eight that I was like, oh, if I saw that, I'd be like, oh, it's pretty good. You know, like, I, you know, that's kind of my, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of them that I think are, you know, kind of middle of the road or junk or whatever, but they're, but they, um, uh, but I think that I get six to eight out of them. And the, the reality is because we do a show every day, six to eight is too many. Like we te- we've been testing this. Six to eight is too many to publish. Um, so you really have to, you know, when we're looking at a show that we're producing, as we start to really get this going as a machine, we're really looking for like two, you know, four at the max, you know, of of, of videos that we can get out of any given day that we do this, this show. Um, we're looking for two to four uh, clips that we could put out that are about what we're doing. Um, and again, I think what I'm going to end up doing is processing this for 60 seconds and then going back and process. It's kind of, it gets a little expensive for me to do this, but, but process it again for three minutes. And those three minute ones are really designed if I want to put them on LinkedIn, which will be like one out of a week. At TikTok, I might put out two or three a day, you know, kind of thing to, to have them out there. But the, the goal is, is that and then the other thing is, and the reason for this is this whole thing that I think Liberty was talking about, you put something out and you get 300 views and you put some out and you get 2,000 or 3,000 or 4,000 views and you really don't know which one it's going to be. <laughs> like, I'd love to say, you know, and I, I was talking, you know, and, and like TikTokers will put out like three or four versions of the same thing. And the one that doesn't, the ones that don't take off, they just get rid of them. And so what we've been doing a little bit on our site is if you don't get 500 views, if I don't get 500 views in the first 24 hours, I make it unlisted. I don't want to make it uh, private because it creates dead links and that people won't appreciate that. Um, but I unlist them so that if you see our short section, what I want to do is make sure that if you see our short section, it's the strongest things that, that, that we had there as opposed, you know, I don't want you scroll. And that's why TikTokers do it is they don't want you scrolling through things that didn't work. You know, they want you to scroll when you see, because what happens, the typical behavior in a TikToker or shorts, I see something, I go, oh, that's really good. Let's look at the channel. And then do I see lots of things on the channel and I'm making a decision about whether I want to subscribe to that channel or not based on the next five or six things on that channel. I'm going to make a bunch of decisions about that, about that person, you know, um, you know, like <laughs> there's one where this person on TikTok is dancing to David Gray's, uh, what's it, Babylon or whatever. And, uh, and she just keeps on doing the same thing. Like it was, it's a really fun video, but then she just keeps on doing the same thing over and over again. You're like, ah, I don't know if I need to see that over and over again. So, so the, um, you know, so you, you go through and look at that channel and make a decision about what that channel is going to look like. So what I want to do is make sure when people go to our TikTok channel or go to our, our YouTube channel that they go, oh, that's really cool. And these are all insightful, you know, whatever. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, um, I think it would be cool, and th- this is might be for slightly later. I th- the um, would you call it the speaker view that we make? If we could generate that output and put a little bit of a frame with a fat bottom, can you reposition the text? Yeah, the oh. overlays. Oh yeah. Okay, I think we should make a little table mat. With our little rounded corners, it kind of looks like the show. A little blue at the top, a little thin down the side. We get to squeeze everybody back a little, put a fat chin on it so you can put all the text down there that has the show look of blue and just take that speaker view, run it through that table mat, uh, placemat, so to speak, record that and have that be the one that you're cycling through. Put all the text in the heavy chin. It'd be re- it'd look really handsome. I think we should try. You'd it. look very handsome if we did that, Alex. Why? Why? Thank you. Well, then we're definitely doing it. See, he he knew the trick. He knew the trick. Uh, yeah. So he's like, oh, well, then of course. Uh, anyway, oh, of course. so go ahead, go ahead, Jeff. Should we wear ascots? Yep. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. I'm definitely going to get an ascot for that. If we're going to do that, if we're going to put a, a whole thing across the bottom, totally getting an ascot. Uh, I mean, would that be would that be hard to do to generate that feed uh, uh, nice. simultaneously while we're doing the show? 
No, it wouldn't be. We'll we'll, we'll take a look at it. Yeah, we'll. Yeah, uh, can you good. Have, uh, maybe it'd be hard. Like it wouldn't be hard, hard, but it would be. We'd have to think about it because we don't have a. Right now, it's just a raw video output. We'd have to run it through a switcher to. to yeah, I mean, you're pretty smart. You could probably figure it out, right? I'm not that smart. Um. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Jeff. Now, can you have uh, templates saved in Opus and say this you is might what be you should to. use? So, yeah, we can we can take a look at it. Okay. I mean, there may be a way to. Uh, um, to save a template in there to put it in. And again, it could be something that uh, you could also do it in Compressor where you grab it, you download it from Opus and throw it into Compressor and just run them all through that. And it would take, you know, it wouldn't take very long. You put them into a watch folder in, in Compressor, download them and push it in. But yeah, I, I, I think that uh, at first, I think burning them in would be, I think we'd figure out what we like first. <laughs> <laughs> so, now, I like, I like said, the idea though. I'm I'm sold on the idea. We have to, one of the tricky parts about putting that text in there, and as long as we keep it in the same place, is that there's a rat, all this, well, you know, debris, you know, screen debris that occurs from all these different social sites. But if we get the, if we just, I see what you're saying though, is just to zoom out. We'll frame it. We'll, we'll leave it. some space for the gradue at the bottom. Yeah. We'll leave okay, some I'm, blank I'm chin you to for design. the text. I'm going to send you a raw video I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm working out right now. Our I, okay. I, I got to go. Right. This is this is what happens with uh with with when you say hey I've got a good idea with Alex it's like I think that's a great idea you should do it <laughs> thanks ahead, for Liberty. volunteering <laughs> go ahead Liberty so I've got two questions the first one being um when you mentioned putting out like you're looking for almost like two clips two to four clips mm -hmm. what is it that you are anticipating with that like the end goal of the clip is awareness it a, is yeah, strong answers like yeah. Yeah, so I think that the um, number one is it's a service. Like we want to have you at least think about like maybe we brought something up. In one minute, we can't always have a complete answer. Like that's just the that's the reality. So you have to kind of be a little thick skinned about that. I think people ping me about it. Like the one minute answer is just a taste. I'm like, okay, well, that's all I can do in a minute. Like, you know, like we don't, we can't clip that all in. Um, but I also think that it gives people an example of what we're doing to a wider group. One of the things that's interesting is that what generally when you look at the stats of our shorts, 90 to 95% of the people who watch the shorts are not subscribers to us right now. So that's a huge opportunity for us, for people to understand like the goal is really that they will go, huh, office hours is pretty cool. And, and I will say we slowed down a little bit because I, first I did too many. Then we thought about doing it by hand. And then I stopped and was like, okay, I got to rethink this for a little bit because it wasn't, you know, it was working for a while and then not working as well. And so I, you know, I think I, because I was putting out like six a day or something like that. You know, it was like, it was like, I can make all of these and, and put them all out. And so now we're kind of backing up a little bit, um, you know, uh, and figuring some stuff out. But that's why we're doing this. We're doing it because, you know, what we should be doing is office, in office hours is taking some advantage of every platform that's out there that is, you know, and partially because we just need to know how it works. Like I'm, you know, we're getting ready to do uh, streaming to LinkedIn, which I'm really excited about. But, you know, the streaming platform for LinkedIn is a little complicated and to do it, you know, with RTMP and to get it all set up and everything else. But that's important. It's important that we go through that process and do it fairly regularly so that we go, oh, well, this is how you do this in LinkedIn. And the same thing with Facebook and the same thing with Instagram and the same thing with TikTok. And we, sh we need to be doing, like we need to know what those things are to serve our, our audience. And so doing shorts, the process of doing shorts and learning how we should do it for different platforms and what works, the biggest reason we're doing it is so that we can answer questions about it when when it comes up, you know? And, and but the uh, ancillary reasons for it is, um, because what happens is, when you do things and you get your head around the experience of doing them, um, then when you meet someone who's a TikToker or an Instagram per, you know, influencer or a, or a YouTuber, you have better questions because you've already done a bunch of those things. Like when you haven't done it all, it's pretty clear that you haven't done it at all. You know, like, you know, like you'll ask a stupid question and they'll, the same thing with like, I think my S, S24 is shot, it looks exactly like an Aerie their way of answering your a, a filmmaker's way of answering your questions will change dramatically you know like like hey here's a tripod do you know what a tripod does you know like you know and so in the same way uh if you ask someone who's an influencer a question that is super simple that they should have already that you should have already known their view of you is going to change and their answers are going to change and so so when you when you work in these in these environments and you're figuring this stuff out and you and again the 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 human way of learning, the most human, we can have lots of discussions about pedagogy, but the human way of learning is 
I watch, I ask questions, I do it, I ask questions, I watch, I ask questions, repeat, 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 repeat. That's how we learn language. That's how we learn everything about our society. That's how we learn how to interact with our family. That's how we do everything. You know, and so, and so the thing is, is that, and that's why little kids ask so many questions. <laughs> so is because they're, they're trying to, they're, they're triangulating all of that information. And we're, we naturally do that. So it's important though, is to do the doing part, you know, because you don't know it until you do it. And so, so our number one reason for doing this is to figure it out and to do things like this hour where we share, this is what we know so far, not claiming that we know everything. There's, there's a lot of experts that are there, but, but we want to, this is what we're figuring out. Um, and we'll keep on doing it. We'll do this again in six months and we'll have a whole different set of opinions and processes. And then I was just going to um, quickly share, someone had asked a question about like templates. So there's this other tool too, vidai, video.ai. And so you're able to, like it still has the same thing with just being able to do scores and your ability to like have templates in there. So some of the clients that we've done that work is like, we use it to customize the templates and see. So similar to Alex said, just testing the look and the feel. I'm not showing any, any client stuff here, but this is just and, a tutorial. Yeah, go ahead. And by the way, here's the, I, I think we can do this here, Chris, because here's the overlay and image. So here's the overlay image. So if we build that overlay image there, I think we can just apply it to, in fact, I think I can build that into my my group, my my preset template. You so could, I, except the, 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 the advantage of letting the guys do it on the on the back end, because I, I've been talking with JJ, they can, if, if we have an image, they can generate it, they can squeeze it back, they can we can get a little, it, it, we, we get to fight the big head problem also because we get to squeeze it back a little bit, just a little, a little 5% right. maybe. And just, but yeah, they, so they can, but what we could also do is, I, I guess I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, gonna on, work, often, I'm often gonna hesitant, work. I'm often hesitant to burn graphics into things. And so, so if we're capturing something, my temptation would be to say, go ahead and leave that, like go ahead and zoom out a little bit. And just leave a um, a rough area at the bottom, you know, for that. But I'm open to it. I mean, it, look, we're experimenting. It, it's like it's, it's it, it, we, we, we produce so much content that we can do this and go, oh, we did that for a weekend. We decided we didn't like it or like it or whatever. Except for the people that keep calling and going, hey, where's those shorts that have the blue border? I really miss those. <laughs> yeah, Are those yeah. ever going to come back? Yeah, exactly. But, and then just it, one last thing with the just going back to Opus for a second is they also had a lot of announcements a few weeks ago, like in February. And yeah. I hear there's some more coming in June. Mm -hmm. um, their AI B-roll generator is something to it hasn't been rolled out to everyone just yet, but something to look into. So just going back to the various comparisons. So there's a lot to, for us to to play around with and test. Absolutely, Jeff. Yeah, and I think, you know, Chris, really to your point, that that is, frankly, the argument, in my opinion, of why if Opus, and, I, and I'll show you how templates work in Descript, um, you know, if you have the, the raw footage without that burned in, then you have the ability to skin it differently with those templates. And if we find out the blue border is way, performs way better, then things can be repurposed with that blue border. It's going to be huge. Tom, yeah, I'm, I'm, I have to admit that it's just that uh, the, the, in the world of famous last words, I'd want to have that. Uh, I'm, you know, the more I think about it, the less I like the idea of it being burned in live. Like I just, you know, it's like not a, like I'd rather build a template for it because if I decide I want to use that for anything else, then I'm going to be really bummed that I... Same argument that. for audio processing, right? You know, record the raw... Yeah. As opposed to, uh, aside from what we do here, I'm uh, just trying to I make it go fast and quick, fast oh, yeah. and quick. I oh, know oh, this yeah. disposable shovelware the, media. The yeah. template, if, if uh, Opus supports templates, in other words, you say you build a template and say, okay, now when you spit these next forty out, but you know, use this template, base it on that. Uh, that's potentially quicker. Um, and, and I just wanted to say to to what you were talking about before in terms of what platforms and and there's a question in the in the uh, chat from from Greg about is is the potential 
audience on TikTok? Well, of course, there is a potential audience. And from a marketing standpoint, it's always the argument of trying to go to where your audience and potential prospective audience is also. So are there folks on TikTok that would be interested in content here? Sure. And are we, are we more likely to grab some of those that have never heard of the show by short little bites that are um, interesting, but of course can't satisfy the topic? Uh, yeah. Obviously, well, there's and, some potential there. And I think that, that, that functionally for us, I mean, we're definitely very interested in it. And uh, we will be talking more about volunteers next week because uh, we have a volunteer meeting a week, a week from Saturday. And if you're interested in this, we are looking at building up a team that's just going to focus on this stuff. You know, like it's just going to be like looking at how do we repurpose our content um, out to lots of different things. And so, um, you know, I can do a certain amount of experimentation. Usually what happens is I start fiddling with things. Other people fiddle with it and I say, no, I don't think it's a good idea. And then they slowly break me down and then I go, okay. And then I start playing with it and then I go, oh, this is, a, I like green eggs and ham. And then I go, let's build a team to make more green, like let's build a whole diner that does green eggs and ham. Like, you know, and so, no. like, so that's, did that's, I hear, that's, <laughs> and just real quick, did I hear you correctly that the same <laughs> video that you've already uploaded and it's gone through and transcribed and everything yeah. that if you say, okay, now I want 90 second clips uh, you're charged I would give it the same that, link. I would just give it the same that, link and and do it again. But you're charged for that processing time because I thought it yeah. was just the initial analysis processing mm, time. Like, I don't if know. You upload a two two hour video. That's how it is on Descript, for example. If I upload right. a two hour video and tell it to transcribe that two hour video, that's it. I'll get charged for that time, and now I can do whatever I want with it um, within the confines of the plan. Well, it still has to process it again. So um, I'll have to take a look at whether I want to. I'll what have to take a look at that. I don't. What I, is uh, the pixel count that you're uploading? Uh, Do you it even is, know? I don't know. It's, it's still it's still 1080 high, so it's going to be you know 1080 by um, whatever wide nine the, the the vertical format. So it's 1080 high. 1080 by 540 maybe or something, something like that. 960. No, it's not. It's not that. 540. I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't have it right on the top of my head. It's not five forty because that's half that ten eighty. Is that that's what Opus generates? Yeah, ten eighty by nineteen eighty. No, no, it's generating the it's generating the nine by sixteen. I just don't have that that I don't have that number in my head. It's the nine by sixteen. Um, from ten eighty. So yeah, so it's not it's not ten eighty. It's not nineteen twenty by ten eighty, but it's ten eighty by nineteen. No, by 1080. It's so it's like it might be 600 by 1080 or something like that. But it's it's something. It's yeah. I don't have that number in my head. Okay. It but Opus puts out the format that <laughs> I upload to it. I I just don't have I just don't have it in my head off off the top of my head. So if you were in theory to download one of those one minute videos mm -hmm. and open it up in QuickTime, QuickTime could tell. No, I, I think QuickTime can tell that. you the frame size. That, Chris, I can't. I can't. I can't do that. That's too hard. You're asking me to do a complicated thing, and I can't. I think make that didn't QuickTime recently add the feature of showing frame size? Yeah, just give me one second here. Let me. Um, it is drum roll, please. Um, information. It is uh, ten. So does get info. I guess it's 1080 by. It says 1080 by 1920. So I, I'm wondering whether it's scaling it up. So it is 1080 by. It says it's scaling it up. I guess it's scaling. Oh, it's current. Yeah, the resolution. So it is, it's rendering it at 1080 by 1920, but it's not like it, it wasn't originally that, right? It's so it took the 1080 it. vertical, blew it up to 1920, and then cropped out the sides. Well, we're giving it, a, we're giving it a cropped version already. We're giving it a vertical version at the moment. Like we're just giving okay. it, you know, we're already cutting it that way. Um, but I think that, yeah. I think it's interesting. I, I do think that what, what we're going to find if we try to do it live to the live stuff is that it gets really heavy. Like, hey, we want to make a bunch of adjustments. I think we want to figure out what we, what we want it to look like before we have the live one burning it in. Like once we've done it a couple of times, I think, I think we want to use the raw, the raw one. In fact, I would say that I probably want to use, want that stream to not be 9 by 16, but be actually just 16 by 9 of the active speaker so that we can figure out the framing. Because right now we can't, you know, from that. In the in the Opus template uh, feature, mm -hmm. is it just a pure overlay? It's just going to slap so. it on top I've of what you're on? So we'll okay. find out. 
Yeah, like, do you know I Liberty? If you send me a ping, I can do it right now while we're talking on the show. Like you just gotta text me a ping. So, I'm gonna start Chris, showing. Again. I'll, I'll I'll work on it. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Jeff. Why don't you show the, the script and I'll build a ping. Yeah. So let me. Um, and again, I'm super curious to see if uh, it, what, if they've picked the same clips or some overlapping ones. So let me share this. <clears throat> okay, and I'll start with. Um, I did some pre-selections, but I'll start with uh, showing you what it looks like. Um, so I've already up now. By the way, I did not get to start with the uh, with the cheat code and the the vertical video. I didn't know that existed, so I I just took the original sixteen by nine video, fed it into Descript, and. Okay, so what we're looking at here is this is the full video, and they do it. Uh, Again, this is real. I mean, Descript is really designed, especially on the surface. When you first look at it, um, they hide a lot of the tools. There's some decent tools here, but they hide a lot of it. It's really meant to serve um, someone that really does not know how to edit audio or video. It, the theory is really it's like opening uh, a Word document. You know, they transcribe it and. The premise is if you want to never see waveforms or timelines or anything like that, you can just work off of this text. It's similarly not not uh, always perfect, but anyhow. And then the there's no switches for the most part. They use this AI natural language question. I'll work backwards. I'll show it to you. But I did. I didn't realize you got that many clips. So I asked it to run one more time while we were talking and find 40 clips for me. So this is the difference. This is today where they stop is I can ask it to show me sections that will make good clips. And as you can see, uh, it's highlighted different sections. Now what I can do is I can take all these highlights and I can make uh, the equivalent of uh, an additional timeline. So now it's, it's uh, hopefully it's turning and it's going to give me in a moment an an another timeline. They call it a composition. And, <clears throat> and then I'll show you some I already did. Okay, so it's got my new, so as you can see, this is now, it's, it's extracted each of those clips and, and put them over here, uh, almost looks like slides in a slide deck. And now I'm going to back out of here and show you one that I already did on the same episode. So this one I took. Um, I think this is like it pulled out 20 clips and, um, and so I did have to tell it to, um, use the, uh, the vertical, but now this whole, um, timeline is just another timeline of the same file, but now everything is vertical. I've applied a template, um, and I don't think you're going to, hopefully I'm hiding the audio from you, but you can see. This is a really simple example, and I've just applied this template, and I can save, I can kind of customize a template and save it and um, and have it do the orientation. By the way, Guy was a good example of how our, our head alignment really makes a difference because with the short amount of space, he's going to start, if I have the text high enough to not get blocked by all the platform stuff, then we start to get into the person if if there's a little bit too much headroom. But um, let me just also show you uh, what we can do with templates here. So this is just one I took and kind of made real simple. They do have, uh, and you can, uh, with a paid plan, you can save templates. So you can customize it to your heart's content and save that template. And But then they also have tons of stuff in the gallery. A lot of um, 16 by nine, but they have a handful of, uh, vertical templates I can choose from. Um, these are more stylized, uh, but I can also simply just start off with one of these different caption templates. Uh, it's interesting. I don't know which one came first, who did it first, but this is, and you see it's applying the template. This looks like the same, uh, at least 
text coloring that Opus is using. So I'm, I wonder who used it first. Now, right now, it's applied it just to this first clip. And I can tell it also uh, if I want to apply it to all of them. So right now, this is the big difference. And now from here, by the way, I can... Um, and, and you get a... Because again, this is really meant as a more of a full-fledged editor. You really do get... Um, a potentially um, more flexibility over the design, um, everything from, you know, the exact orientation of how you want everything cropped, uh, all the fonts. Um, you can customize down to the detail of the color of the highlighted word, um, which is the active word, the background. You can put future words if you want that to appear differently. There's a, a decent selection of effects you can apply to this caption text. You can also, of course, have static text and layers of, of graphics, borders, uh, et cetera. You can also do, um, you can make custom animations where you kind of draw out the animation and, and it will do that. So um, decent amount of design choices. Um, but again, this is the extra step yeah. is you have to go in there. Now, I will actually show one other thing that uh, perhaps is a, is a good differentiator. <clears throat> I took... So I took something that it didn't identify um, as a good clip. Now, I'll show you an example. I was having trouble. Uh, okay, here it is. <clears throat> so I can take uh, I can take this stuff right here. And we've here. got a couple questions here. So you, we're going to let, let's, let's, let's answer a couple of questions before we go any further um, because we yeah, don't, I don't want to run out of time. So let's go to the first question. Our first question comes from Douglas Carmichael, and Douglas says, would there be any way to train Opus to look for specific phrases like next question to trigger creating a new clip? Yeah, I think that um, we have a, 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 someone else that we're going to bring on uh, in the future <laughs> that I think is working on something that could do that more effectively. Uh, I might be able to use that in the phrases um, that, are the, that, are, that are in Opus to grab onto next question and might pop out all of them. Um, one of the things I talked to Ken Jordan about is also using, you know, building something in ChatGPT that would go out in there and, and build a, basically build an EDL, you know, from those things looking for next question as the edit point. Yeah, go ahead, Liberty. Um, no, yeah, and I was just going to add too is that um, if you also, when you're putting up the clips, you can also train it like the thumbs up and down for it to eventually get a sensibility of what kind of content that you're looking um, for in addition to what you just said. <laughs> Absolutely. Go ahead, Jeff. Can you hear us? I'm sorry. This is one of the differences is that in Descript, it is from the beginning based on natural language. So you see, I come in here and now I say I want to do some AI stuff. I believe, by the way, they are using uh, OpenAI. So mm -hmm. what I'm starting with is just this find good clips. And from here, it is natural language. So, for example, I can say find uh, good clips. Um and I can say, you know, that mention, uh, uh, that mention Apple, for example. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think that what we want to try to figure out is some workflow that says what we're really trying to get to on our end is getting a workflow that says, look for next question. This is why we're trying to have all the hosts say next question. Next question. <laughs> like, and, and you know, like take a breath and then say next question. And presumably. Um, and, and so give me all of the next questions and put them all, you know, that's all I want you to do is cut them out there. So that's the, you know, that's what we're trying to get to there. And because this is based on natural language, I haven't tested it. It's a good point. Mm -hmm. Presumably you can say that start after the phrase quote. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so, yeah. So I think it's, it's almost a programming language or some kind of prompt language is something we're all looking for here. Uh, next question. Brad Woodall in Boston asks, in Descript, can you export the clips to an editing program? Yeah, it showed there that uh, exporting that EDL from uh, Opus. Uh, go ahead, Liberty. Uh, oh, yeah, I was going to say, like, I'm not aware of, like, the actual, like, premiere, but you've got the, um, oh, the word just slipped me, forgive me. Um, when you do export that you can, yeah, not that I'm aware of, we haven't been able to do that. Yeah, it's it's the the clips themselves. If you have it there, let me. I'm just waiting for it to download here. It's uh, 
taking a remarkably long time to download. And I can that show video. you how that works in Descript. Um, but the uh, let's see here. So this is downloading a document. Um, and uh, how interesting it. Hold on, it's um. Yeah, go like ahead, I'm go aware ahead, that you can do trans like the subtitles. So then, if you up, I, I can uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I can just show you. It's, um, yes, and they've gotten a lot better, by the way. So I have a, a handful of options of what I can do. First of all, they have this notion of publish, which is don't wait for it to render down to a file. Publish meaning you get a link to their page and it's, it's actually super fast. Good for at least reviews, things like that. Uh, or if you just want to share something embedded in a web page, for example, it's just quicker. Um, you can also, by the way, hook this up to a handful of platforms I'll show you. But for video uh, and audio, by the way, they've done uh, some really cool things. So this tab I'm on here is to get the actual file. But they've done a lot of works, especially with DaVinci, although it's still in beta, is you can just export to a real timeline. So you see I have, I can export to a Final Cut, Timeline, Premiere, etc. And I can uh, tell it, so for instance, I do uh, use Resolve. I can say, um, include the files. So I'm going to get the files it's working off of, uh, whether or not I create tracks. And and when I export, I'm going to get, you know, the actual full timeline files, everything uh, with all the edit points. Now, the edit points as is. That's one thing I was just going to show uh, real quick is if you do... If one of its edits, so I can similarly say, you know, I don't want this section here, and I can, I like instead of deleting the strike through feature, so I can see it, but it is excluded. And then if this edit is not clean, I have two options. If you see, I can click on the actual edit point uh, that I had a moment ago. There we go. And I have and this have little to move AI reader. this, Jeff, because we have to, we have to get to a couple more questions. So just, Okay. So anyhow, if I do some of the audio edits in here, like on the timeline, I can, you know, I, I can get back to basics and then export that as a timeline or actual files. Yeah. And then, and then if you look at this as I exported this out as Premiere. So what I ended up with is a caption folder that had all, all the, all these are, are broken out into their own GIFs. Um, and then there is a, uh, SRT folder, um, SRT, um, of the, all the captions, so if you want to do it yourself, um, it has a uh, reframe. It's showing you, it'll have a little thing on how to reframe that. It shows you how to deal with it in Premiere. Um, it also has the raw video, and this doesn't have any of the lower thirds in it. So it's giving, it's section, it's not taking it from the original image. It's giving you a, that section with all the bits and pieces that you would need to, to put it back together if you want to do some more fine editing, which is pretty interesting. Uh, next question. Bobby Rafferty in Central Florida asks, isn't there a safe zones that YouTube overlays on your content? For example, the like buttons. Yeah, you have to pay attention to that and it changes all the time. You know, so that's what really one of the challenges is that that safe zone is something that when we get active doing these for clients, uh, we're updating them every, us usually every Thursday. <laughs> Let's just say we usually update most of our, our, our templates on Thursday and make sure that they still are valid. Um, uh, go ahead, Chris. I'm not going to beat this horse, but so the, this resolution thing is super interesting. They ask for 1080 by 1920 as their upload resolution. That's what they want. And yet on my phone, my phone is not nine by 16. My phone is yep. nine by 18 and a half or 19 and a half or something crazy like that. And so that means they're going to take my 9 by 16 video and they're going to stretch it vertically, which is going to squash it sideways because mm -hmm. my head's going to just get bigger mm -hmm. and bigger and bigger as they fill the frame. I and think then that, I think that how the do they do it for all the different phones? Yeah, right. And this is why I think burning it in is going to be hard because I think that we're going to have to have different formats for different platforms. You know, so you're going to you're going to want something that has those bits and pieces there, but we have to kind of figure out how we're going to do these for the different platforms. That's going to be the challenge. Um, you know, cause they're all different. They're all different. The, the, uh, the screen, you know, debris is different for each one of these, how they handle that resolution is different for each one of them. You know, like they're all different and some of them want to be square and some of them want to be, but this goes back to our framing size. And you've been saying, I think we want our heads a little smaller, a little smaller. I think this is a biggest, uh, yeah. 
reason for it because mm-hmm. our faces will get wider as they stretch yeah. it to fill a vertical phone. Yeah, I think that we do want it to, I think we want to have our faces be smaller. So the Fenwick frame has to get smaller. Um, you know, next question. Dave Troutman, Edmonton, Canada. Does using auto clipping when starting out in the business reduce the chance of learning the necessary skills in editing generally? Should we advise caution? Go ahead, Bill, real quick. What is editing? Editing used to be 16 by 9 for movies and things like that. Now it is just as reasonably doing vertical content for social media. So uh, my go-to example is... um, Michael Jordan, the basketball player, was great in basketball, tried to do baseball. It's a different thing. He was really good because he's a good athlete, but he wasn't perfect at it because he didn't – you can't just hop back and forth and expect to be great at one thing so you're great at another. You have to learn your discipline yeah, go and be good at it. Jeff, real quick. Yes, uh, of course it does, but the real question is, does it matter? In other words, if you're not an editor – um, if you're the CEO of a small company mm-hmm. and you're doing videos, then why you, would you bother learning? Yeah, well, here's, uh, and, and I think that the thing is, is that if I was teaching people editing, I would probably um, have them edit these all by hand. Like, let me give you a whole bunch of things and have you do them all because doing hundreds of these will make you better at what you do and doing hundreds of anything will make you better at what you do. And you do need to do that if you want to become a good editor. Um, but I think that if you're a business or you're an organization like us, we don't if, it, look if if ten people come to me and say we want to we don't want to use Opus, we want to hand you know handcraft shorts. I'm all for it. <laughs> like, like just you know, like I'm all I'm all for having people handcraft these. They'll look nicer. They'll look better. What I'm but what we're looking at is hey, we're generating uh, two hours of content a day. It'd be great if a little a little bit of that dribbled out so that people could see what we're doing and potentially provide a little th- thought process. There's so many things that I'm watching that are people are grabbing from their much longer videos. There's a guy from um, uh, from one of the big marketing firms that's on TikTok that I just he obviously gives out whole weekends of knowledge about how marketing works that are fascinating. But I'm getting little one minute or two minute. Uh, clips of them while I'm biking in the morning, you know, and I really like that. Um, Next question. Douglas Carmichael, would there be any way to embed a marker like the dictaphone microcassette recorders of old in the recorded event as it happens and use those markers for making clips later? So one of the things that uh, Jason Snell does is he's got a script uh, with a stream deck that he built with shortcuts that he just pushes a thing on a stream deck of that needs to be edited or this is a good clip or this is whatever. And he just, and he has the different functions there. And what it does is it, I I don't know whether it actually builds an EDL, but it definitely puts the time codes in of these are the things that I want to, that I want to do that I, that I think we should look at. And I think us having something really easy to to do that would be great in the future. Um, But we'd have to, again, we need a team to think about how to do that. You know, go Jeff real quick. Yeah, they, um, the ability to use it is the question. So Descript currently does not. Uh, they have markers, the concept of markers, but you cannot yet import them, but it's a highly requested feature. Next question. Bobby Rafferty, Central Florida. When you say captions, are they closed captions or just graphic overlays on the videos? Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, with Descript, you can export your transcript as an actual uh, and get a closed caption file. Yeah. As well in as using what you're, that transcript. Yeah, and what you're looking at there, though, is subtitles. So mm-hmm. those are those are technically subtitles. They're not legal captions. Legal captions have a very specific definition. Um, and legal captions also have things like audio descriptors and other things that are built. When you say captions and you say this is a caption, so anything that doesn't have so, yes, it the is audio descriptions and file. everything else, everything, it's all, it's all subtitles. Um, yeah, there. So yeah, next question. Dave Troutman, Edmonton, Canada, has our last one. Just as 4K video content changed editing by allowing crops and reframing, will these tools change the way people create content once again? It already has. I mean, it's like (laughs) we changed so many things. uh, You know, part of the reason that I watch uh, that I watch a lot of TikTok and I watch um, and I watch the YouTube shorts and I watch uh, as many different forms of content as possible is to watch what's happening and to see what parts I like and what I want to take away. I don't feel like I have to do everything that everybody else is doing. Like I don't have to hold a lav and talk into it like an idiot. <laughs> like I don't like I don't have to do that that part. Like I I just like that it, like I'm not going to buy into that. Like I'm not going to buy into that look and feel. It just it's just like what the what um but there are many things that I'm learning about 
you know, constantly cutting. Th- Are you holding the lamp? I'm sorry. I, oh, no. I am. I am. You, because I like that look. And it, it, yes. Oh, no, you know, somebody tuned that, that lamp like, to be on your like, chest. It's a lamp. It's a lamp. <laughs> so anyway, it's, 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 it's such a, it's such a, like, it just seems like a weird, like that seems like fast fashion. Like to me, the holding up the lab is fast fashion, but the, hey, we don't, don't know what jump the problem up. is. Yeah, exactly. H and M made a lot of money. Um, yeah, so it's fast fashion, uh, but I will say that that the, um, but like things like, hey, we we're okay with jump cuts. I've gotten to the use to the fact that I I really think jump cuts are fine. You know, like I and I didn't think that like if I was even close to a jump cut, I'd be like, oh, we can't use that clip. Now I'm kind of like, well, you just suck a lot of energy out of it. And you watch some of the YouTubers that really talk about how to keep that energy going and how to move it forward. Um, you know, and and I think that. Uh, you know, it's really easy to fall into looking like old content if you don't pay attention to what the new content is looking like. Because, and it, and a lot of it has to do with, I mean, we have to get back to much of this has to do with content density. How do I have a lot of content all at one time? And I think that we're getting better and better at that. Um, but I do think that, and there's some things that I, again, that I'm not going to follow along, like holding on the lab. I'm sorry, I was so rough about it. And But I... But I just, oh, I just look at it every single time and I'm just like, there are certain that I'm just, a, 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 it's abhorrent to me. Uh, but, but I think that there are a lot of things about, about uh, the social media stuff that I've totally adopted and love to do and think it's cool and fun. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. There's one guy, I think I've mentioned this before, he didn't even hold the lab. He holds the end of his tip ring ring sleeve connector and talks into it like it is a lab. Uh, but what I was going to say is, it, you know, the, the, the jump cut thing, I got to tell you, as somebody who's been doing this for decades, if you ab- adopt the jump cut and go, I'm okay with the jump cut, it's a different style of editing and it's not a layup. It's not necessarily super easy to do to oh, just no, it's pull not out. All. Jump cuts it's, are... These guys are... They, I, they're, I have stuff to learn. density goes way up. Yeah, Four decades of doing this, I have stuff to learn. You know, and it's funny, I was talking to someone who has a pretty pretty big channel um you know on one of the larger ones maybe <laughs> and uh they're like hey we bring people in from hollywood all the time we used to bring people in from hollywood all the time we just couldn't get them to, like they would not do what it takes to do this and 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 they and you know they won't do it because they're like oh that's against all these rules and all this other stuff and they're like hey you get to tell us when you have a, a when you when your videos have 30 million views you get to tell us how to edit <laughs> you know, like you know like like you know like and you, just, you just let us know when that happens and then and then we'll we'll do that yeah go ahead liberty yeah, it's a lot of unlearning. Like Chris said, I put it in the chat was like some of those people with those labs, their storytelling is so tight. So it is. just just learning and embracing and changing and getting in where you fit in. I think I think that the key is always not to is to always to look at what about that makes it valuable, not that it is uh, you always want to deconstruct a video and their storytelling is great. And the use of that probably wouldn't have made a difference. Like they probably could have done it a lot of different ways and made it even better. And so the, the, you know, that, that's the whole thing. And so that, and that with every artist and with everything that you see, people will do good things and bad things. And you're trying to always try to remove as many of the bad things as you can, but when do you lose the magic, you know, whatever created it. So anyway, it was a fun, fun hour, fun hour that I was, again, as always certain that would last about a minute. And, uh, <laughs> and so, and so anyway, so thanks everybody. Uh, thanks to the, uh, the panelists who came today to share both the first hour and the second hour. We can't do this without you. Really, we really can't do it without you. Um, and, uh, thanks to the incredible team on the back end that, uh, makes all of this happen that, you know, there's just this incredible team that's cutting all these things, figuring out how we're going to do vertical video, um, you know, putting all these things together and, you know, organizing these shows and, and and cutting the show itself. And we just really appreciate your contribution. And of course, thank you to the panelists who, I'm not the panelists, but the producers who are asking all these questions, keeping all these hours going. It's really the only show that I know of that we're all doing this together. Like there's just a huge group of people that were building a show for all of us. Um, and uh, we're all, we all have our roles and uh, everyone's doing a great job. So um, uh, we traveled 29,000 miles today, 47,000 kilometers, and that is 233 million bananas for scale. Okay, let's go ahead and jump into after hours. I'm telling you, this resolution discussion is super interesting to me. Yeah, it's a it's a big. I mean, I mean like like so look at this. This is this is a free a, a frame grab yeah. from one of our shorts. Look how yeah. tight Adam looks because They're they have to t- and and the the blue here. That's 
1920 by or 1080 by 1920. So well, and then it's I built making it longer. I built a 1080 by 1920 in Keynote to try to really quickly build a little frame. And it came out all like, it came, it popped into the top part. <laughs> like, I don't know what happened. So, so now I got to go back and look at like what's going on there. So yeah, there's a bunch of things to unwrap here. I like the idea of the frame. I just think that we should experiment with it without burning it into the thing first and then, and then look at it in different formats and then, and then apply the, it. The, the disadvantage, 